seeing as we have a quorum of the town council present on January 27th, 2020, I am calling the meeting to order at 6.30 p.m. A couple quick announcements. Um, several of the counselors and the staff were able to attend the annual Mass Municipal Association this past Friday and Saturday. On the February 1st, we have two events you might be interested in. The first is the Four Towns meeting, which is the regional schools, and it is at 9 o'clock a.m. and the Amherst Regional Middle School Library. On later in the day, at 1 o'clock, we will do the flag raising for Black History Month on the steps of, and on the common, North Common, and the steps of Town Hall. On February 10th, we will have a hearing um, regarding a Verizon request to, restore, to install conduit locations on Spring Street. This is based on us being the keepers of the public way. And on that same evening, we will also have a public way request to install a ramp at the Amherst Visitor Information Center at 35 South Pleasant Street. Um, the, this is for those people particularly interested in 132 Northampton Road. Valley CDC has submitted their pro project eligibility letter for 132 Northampton Road. However, I want to be very clear, the state has not sent an acknowledgement. And it's not until the state sends an acknowledgement that the 30-day comment period begins. There will, we will have broad notification of that 30-day comment period. And after that, we will summarize all of the comments and send them off to the state. And finally, um, we do have a change in the order of the agenda tonight. It's up on the screen. We're basically going to go through one through five, as we normally would, including general public comment. We would then go on to a presentation and discussion of the proposed downtown investments. And at 7.45, we will move to action items B and C, um, general bylaws, and then authorizing a discussion of authorization for a public hearing um, regarding Lincoln Avenue. We will then return to item B, I'm sorry, 6A. And at that point, Doug um, Slaughter will be able to join us and that is regarding his report to us as chair of the License Commission and also amendments to the open container law. And then we will continue with the rest of the agenda as planned. Okay. So with that in mind, um, there are no there's no hearing tonight. We will proceed to general public comment. And let me just say the following. It's on matters other than those that are under the agenda listed as having public comment. That includes items 6B and 8A. Public comment on those agenda items will be taken up at the relevant time during the agenda. Residents are welcome to express their views for up to three minutes. Unless we have so many people, I have to restrict it. Counselors are not expected to comment, nor will they comment on matter raised during the issues of general public comment. May I see a hand of those people who would like to speak during general public comment? Let's start in the back on the far back. Far back, general public comment. Okay, I'm sorry. Vince, please come forward. Please state your name and where you live. Uh, Vince O'Connor, uh, Summer Street, Amherst. 
So we are on the basis, uh, the cusp of some momentous change in the United States, which may drastically alter the traditional role of local and police, local and state police departments as enforcers of the codes of political and social, social order, demanded by the one to 10 percent of the 90 to 99 percent. Economic inequality is under attack, front and center. Cannabis and perhaps other drugs are headed for complete uh, decriminalization, if not legalization, as was done so successfully by Portugal, which diverted its drug-related enforcement, criminal justice, and incarceration expenditures into treatment and reduced its addict population by one half. There is the Black Lives Matter move movement. Gambling has become the province of state, local, and tribal governments rather than of the mob, and so forth. Uh, I, don't, I don't think any of expect to read of a Stonewall type uh, situation. So, therefore, the, the present city council may thus become the municipality's first legislative body con to confront the requirement to develop a radically different policing posture for Amherst. It is your good fortune that no terrible incident has occurred which might distort clear thinking about this goal. To, vide, to avoid such a tragic and destructive event, the city must begin the transformation of its policing policies while it has the time and space to do so. I would have preferred to bring this proposal to a smaller number of city councilors on a public safety committee, which many cities have, where I could also address other related issues. The City Council has not seen, seen fit to establish such a committee, so here I am. My proposal is quite simple and direct, backed up by the article before you, The Neuroscience of Prejudice and Stereotyping, from the October 2014, Volume 15 issue of Nature Reviews, Neuroscience. Ten pages, two and a half pages of footnotes. In evaluating future candidates for the police department, you ought to, to make use of the most up-to-date brain research techniques to disqualify candidates who might be more likely than others to employ deep-seated biases unconsciously uh, in policing the, the, and the use of deadly force without good cause. How to, te how to tease out these deep-seated biases Please read the article. There are good reasons to employ such research techniques because, as the article points out, not only does brain testing expose deep-seated candidate biases, it can also reveal which candidates are making a conscious effort to combat their biases. We need you to wrap up. Yeah, I am. Finally, um, as you consider this article and my suggestion, please consider that Massachusetts already has a form of stand your ground, which applies only to police officers. To be black or Latino, the resident of a wrong address police raid, or fail to obey an order from a police officer because you are mentally ill, do not understand English, have PTSD-related panic reaction, and you could be shot dead by an officer whose deep-seated biases were not fully explored during candidate selection. The City Council can prevent such a tragedy from happening in Amherst if it begins now to implement science-based police officer selection. Thank you for your comments. Excuse me, I w you need to be called upon. Thank you. Are there other public comments? I did see a hand in the back earlier. Okay, are there other public comments? Please come forward. You have three minutes maximum. State yes. your name and address. Amy Zuckerman, 117 Brittany Manor Drive. I'm here to invite everyone on the town council, town managers and others in the room to come tour my building as Ed Smith did this afternoon. He's both a health inspector, building inspector, and turns out a former firefighter. I raised the issue of fire prevention, very ma serious matter for lodgings, particularly complexes. I walked with Ed, now he's, this is not his territory, but we did analyze the issue of fire prevention training that does not exist in the Boulders, which has at least 500 residents, if not more, of which is maybe two maintenance people at any given time, or three. There are no diagrams on any floor that show you the layout of the floors. 
So you, where, where the exits? Most of the people in my building are not, don't speak English or well. Are they gonna get out of the fire? When English speakers can't get out of the fire, they panic, how are these people gonna get out? There's no training. I've talked to the fire department many times. I'm not sure if they had to be invited in by the management at the Boulders, but they have not. Oh, Jeff Olmsted, these are great people, but they gotta come in. I said, let's create a training program. Let's put a manual together. Let's have some diagrams. There are 500 or more people in, those, in that place. There's no fire escape. There's a difference between having meeting code for the fire marshal and surviving a fire. Big difference. Are people going to say, there was a fire last spring. Thank God people didn't die. It's amazing. I've seen 35 people die on one night in a fire in Worcester when I photo edited the Gazette. What are we going to do? How about meeting me and take a tour and see why will you not get out of that place if a fire engulfs the hallway? You won't, unless you want to jump from the second, third building story. We could fix it. There's not one lodging in this town that is required to have fire ladders, just put them over the window, climb out, not required. If I want to deal with that to lend to do something with the bylaws, I'm gonna harp on this forever, because if you've ever seen someone dead on the street, people jump out of a building, well, you'd, you'd wake up. This is fire time, and the boulders is not safe. Done. Thank you for your comment. Are there any other people with public comment at this time? Okay, then we're going to proceed. We have two uh, resolutions, our proclamations this evening. The first one is a re resolution in support of House 2810, an act to promote green infrastructure and reduce carbon emissions. It's in your packet and the Governance Organization and Legislation Committee has reviewed it. Mr. Ryan? Yes, we, the committee met on January 8th and <clears throat> voted unanimously to declare the proclamation on House Bill 2810 to be clear, consistent, and actionable. Okay, and this is uh, sponsored by Chris Riddle and sponsored as necessary um, by a counselor, and that is Pat DeAngelis. Is there any other comment, Pat? No, except that I want everybody to I have a sign here that says mic because I never remember to use my mic. So if all of you would make M's whenever you go see me speak. I'm mine. <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> now, this is very important um, legislation that's coming forward to do carbon pricing. And it, it does have um, guidelines so that people of low income who may be most impacted would have a recourse and things like that. So this came before the council a month ago, or we, several weeks ago, and it needs to be passed as quickly as possible, and I'm hoping it will be unanimous. Thank you. Are there any councilor comments at this time? Then could I have a motion? The motion that I need is to adopt the resolution in support of House 2810, an act to promote green infrastructure and reduce carbon emissions as presented. So moved. Second? I second it. Okay, Darcy is the second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? So it's 13-0-0. Uh, the second? Uh, proclamation is regarding Black History Month, and I understand that Patua Mukimba is in the room, is that correct? Maybe she wasn't able to get here, but the co-sponsor on this is the Human Rights Commission, and Pat DeAngelis as the counselor. Um, is there any report from GOL? Again, you all met on January 8 and voted 4-0 with one absent to declare the Black History Month proclamation to be clear, consistent, and actionable. Okay. Uh, the motion that I need is to proclaim February 2020 Black History Month and adopt the Black History Month proclamation as amended by replacing the word noon with the word 1 o'clock p.m. Is there such a motion? Pat? So moved. Second? second. Dorothy? I second. Okay. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain. 13 0, 0 Okay, we will now move on to our first presentation, 
And I'm calling on Mr. Bockelman, and I think you are going to introduce the rest of the team. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Along with Mr. Zomak. Thank you for having us. This is going to be a little bit of a carousel. We have a number of people who are, will be presenting. Um, our, and we're trying a new format for presenting, so that's, we'll see if that works. Yeah, there we are. So tonight, uh, we want to talk about downtown Amherst. It's the heart of our community, the place we come to meet, it's like, like here tonight in Town Hall, uh, to engage with others. It's our Civic Center with the Town Hall, Jones Library, Public Safety Buildings, and Senior Center. It's our Commercial Center with our extensive array of retail offices and businesses. It's the home to many of our religious institutions where we go for entertainment and movies, an extensive array of restaurants with cuisine from across the globe, and our transportation nexus, where many of the roads and many of the bus lines all uh, either wind up here or go through here. So, um, and increasingly, it's becoming the, uh, the residential home of hundreds of people who live here on a, year round, something we hope will develop into a true, vibrant residential community in the years ahead. It's the place where residents come, to, come on Saturdays to shop at the farmer's market, grab supplies at Hastings, enjoy the wonderful chaos of the town fair, or meet a friend for a quiet cup of tea or coffee or a fun night at a bar. It's also a destination for visitors, both those who are looking at colleges and tourists visiting our many cultural attractions. It's a, it's a dynamic place with the opportunity to do much more. But our downtown needs attention. We have done some, but we need to do more. Tonight is a first look for the town council, an opportunity for us to place some projects, ideas really, before the council for your consideration. We are not asking you for, to decide anything tonight. It's the opportunity for us to pre preview what we will be presenting in the next few months and for the public to see what's coming up so they can engage with you as well. We call this Destination Amherst and we want to provide a roadmap for investments, both public and private, in our downtown that will cultivate, enhance, and celebrate the cultural richness of our community and make all of those amenities more accessible to all who live in and visit the town. Tonight, we'll identify the things we're already doing, note the projects that are in the pipeline, and present to the town council as a first look some exciting new opportunities that will, be, that will be presented to you in the coming months. These include a new performing arts shell on the town common, a total rehabilitation of the tired and worn out North Common, including reclaiming one of the most important parcels of town uh, from being dedicated solely to parking, and an impressive idea to construct a parking structure that will address many of the needs identified by the public and business community at no cost to the town. I have one more thing. Uh, these projects are all connected, and that's one reason you see us using this new Prezi format, that, so that they, you can see that we're moving around. Some people get sick by it, because it's like it's movement, but uh, bear with us. So I'm going to speak for a few minutes on Kendrick Park. I know that the council is very familiar with Kendrick. Um, we recently came before you with the exciting news that the town was successful in getting a $400,000 park grant. Uh, that is the largest um, uh, grant that is awarded through the park, Am park grant program, and we're very excited to bring that to you. Uh, as you know, that this, this um, proposal to bring uh, a new playground to Kendrick Park builds on a master plan that was done uh, and participated in by dozens and dozens of citizens, residents, and um, staff, and committee members back in 2011. It calls for a playground and new walkways uh, at Kendrick Park. And again, uh, it's a combination of park grant funding and CPA funding, and we're very grateful to the council for supporting uh, the CPA funds that, that you have authorized. So, Without going into great detail, this is a conceptual design. I wanna make that very clear. I know you know it, and, and hopefully the folks behind me do, and those folks on TV. 
This was a, a conceptual design that we put forth as you have to do for the park grant program. It is not the design for the park. We are now engaging our community in coming up with designs for the playground and walkways. On either side of the conceptual design, you'll see kind of a range of different uh, playground structures, some um, more traditional, some you might see in a, a, a playground like we're doing down at Groff Park, and then on the other side, what we call more of a, a naturalized playground. We had a meeting on January 9th that was well attended, about a two-hour meeting led by the planning department with LSSC commission uh, support and participation. And right now we're gathering all of this community input to put into a design that will be developed uh, with the planning department and DPW and um, through the LSSC commission. Next steps are that, as I said, we'll be developing that plan. We'll hold some community feedback um, meetings in the spring. We're under a very aggressive timeline for this grant, and that is really determined by the park grant folks in Boston. We need to finish the design this spring, probably around June 1st, and we need to put it out to bid in early summer for a beginning construction in the fall of 2020 and completing the park by June 30th of 2021. So that's a very exciting uh, project to activate the north part of our downtown. So next, I'm um, going to invite Gabrielle Gold, who's the executive director of the Business Improvement District, uh, and Jeff Kravitz, who is our economic development director. And as you well know, this is Jeff's probably last presentation to the town council. Um, and we're very fortunate that he's here tonight, and, and thank you for being here, Jeff. Um, I'm going to say a couple words to embarrass him because um, <laughs> we will have another event later this week for town staff and say goodbye to Jeff. But Jeff, as you all have worked with him, know that he brings the highest caliber of work to the town. He's dedicated himself to the mission of economic development in the town. He's done a tremendous amount of work. He's going off to do some really good things. He'll be a colleague uh, in the town of Sunderland as the town administrator there. Um, he's smart, and most importantly, he's really fun to work with. He's going to leave a big hole on the second on the mezzanine for us. So. Follow that <laughs> Uh, hello, Gabrielle Gould, the Executive Director of the Downtown Amherst Bid. Um, good evening. The Bid is here tonight to start the conversation for the Performing Arts Show. We have created a standalone 501c3 foundation. The Downtown Amherst Foundation was created to raise the funds to build and help program a public art and performance space on the South Common. While we have not put any designs out to bid for costs, the foundation intends to launch a capital campaign with the goal of raising $1 million. This will cover the design and building of the structure, secure a maintenance and endowment fund, as well as a fund for programming for the first two years. I think I got this. All right. Uh, the South Common is where we see this structure having the greatest impact. The bid sees the location being where our temporary stage resided last summer. This location agrees with, the Olmsteads, uh, with Olmsteads' original drawings of Amherst screen spaces from 1874. Based on the brief history of the Town Common what, that we are happy to share, as well as our summer concert series, we feel this is where the benefit will be greatest to the downtown, the businesses, and the economic development of our area. We have spoken with many businesses on, on the Common, including the Inn on Boltwood, and each one has welcomed the idea and has asked when. Actually, for over 100 years, the desire for performance space on the common has been notice, noted, and as recently as 1991, a narrow loss of 72 in favor and 76 opposed at town meeting precluded this opportunity for the generous offer from the Rotarians to donate and build this stage. There is a palpable and outspoken desire for our downtown landlords, business owners, and community that Amherst needs more and that the arts and culture are a great way to increase traffic of both our community and tourism to our downtown. Amherst needs to be a destination, not a drive-by. Acoustically, we have spoken to several sound and stage engineers. The proposed location, right there, based on, sorry everybody, uh, based on the natural topography is ideal. 
Something we feel is imperative is that the common be reactivated, a performing art shell that is visible coming into town from all directions instead of hidden away as part of that reactivation. Seeing life and art happening in the heart of a downtown can only have a great impact on invigorating our community. It is our understanding that usage of the common is in downtown Amherst continues to decline and has dropped over 50% in recent years. We need to bring the heart of our community back online. We are working with the architects who won the contest through a public voting charrette hosted by the bid. The contest was a great entry to design but had very little structure as to what was needed in terms of acoustics, size, performance ability a la dance, theater, music, art, lighting, weather, engineering for Northeast climate and more. It did, however, bring us a winning team to work with on design of what could be. Naomi Darling and Ray Mann are very excited to create a design with a bid to present to the design review board, planning board, and council when the time is right. We will also be working with an acoustic engineer out of Boston who has worked on many performance spaces and an engineer to ensure that the shell is sound in terms of weather and building code. The design will focus on functionality with the inherent knowledge that this would be often a piece of sculpture or art on our common and therefore needs to be attractive and pleasing to the eye. We are planning on meeting with town offices regularly to ensure that our design is compliant. The use of the stage will be hugely multi multifaceted. We envision local talents utilizing this, the high school performing arts bringing programming such as theater, band performances, poetry slams, and open mic nights, little kid programming as simple as mommy and me yoga or music classes, local dance and music recitals, local nonprofit and organizations who host events will be able to utilize this space as well as be able as allow us the ability to bring in talent. Some of our goals and ideas range from Shakespeare & Co, uh, traveling dance troupes like Palabalus Modern Dance Company, and all types of music from classical to jazz to rock and roll. Uh, summer viewing of films, festivals, and art shows as well. Uh, the main programming would be in the summer with shoulder season looking at but not limited to parent weekends, graduations, and events from both our own public regional high schools and our university and colleges. In short, how do we encourage the campuses and visiting parents to come into downtown and enjoy Amherst? The BID and the Downtown Amherst Foundation look forward to working with the council and we see great opportunity in working together. We introduce this to the council tonight with a desire to present a more in-depth presentation in late February or early March and then move forward with design. Once design is approved by the powers that be, we intend to get bids on building costs and begin our fundraising endeavors. These are very broad strokes and we know that there's a lot to discuss. I look forward to speaking more about this and to working with the council and the town on this and many great initiatives to ensure that Amherst thrives. This council holds the key to bringing more art and culture to downtown. We are ready to do the legwork and create a space for all to enjoy. The energy and vision with new leadership across the board is sitting in this room. Thank you. So very quickly, building on the uh, uh, Gabrielle's presentation on the main part of the common, um, we're going to move toward the North Common. And uh, um, I think, as Gabrielle said, we look forward in the coming months to presenting a more in-depth proposal to you. But right now, what I'd like to do is cover some of the main uh, aspects of our proposal, which came before the Select Board, actually, back in the fall of 2008. And the select board uh, graciously uh, reviewed our proposal and decided uh, that they would uh, uh, really uh, work with staff, work with the town manager to, to put a pause button a little bit on our plans. And uh, here we are a year later coming back to you uh, and hoping to reinvigorate this, this, this project and review it with you in the months ahead. So this is really a 10-year plan for improvements to the North Common. Um, the effort was led by the historical and LSSE commissions uh, with staff support. Uh, we were able to hire a um, well-respected uh, architectural firm out of Boston, Weston and Sampson. They worked with us to uh, come up with a number of proposals for the North Common. Um, well over 100 uh, people were involved in the effort. We held multiple meetings right here in this room uh, and throughout town 
and gathered input on a range of topics from accessibility to the parking situation in the Main Street lot, uh, trees, um, access, lighting, uh, and the list goes on and on. Um, at that time, we were able to secure a partial funding package from town meeting, and that's really where we, we hit the pause button and uh, fast forward to today. So here's a look very quickly at our town common uh, from the air. Um, it is, it is a, a, an area of town that I think most of us would not be terribly proud of. Uh, it has severe erosion issues. Many of the trees are, are dying or, or in a, uh, later in their lives and, and uh, suffering from disease and, and other ailments. Uh, we have worked closely with Alan Snow, our tree warden, to assess all of the trees on the North Common. So uh, the, the tree warden as well as the Public Shade Tree Committee have been involved in our efforts. And we've looked at everything from electrical service, uh, trees, access, um, the topography of the area prevents very unique challenges. Uh, if any of you have been out there in the uh, a rainstorm and seen the water movement and soil movement from the northwest corner to the southeast corner, um, there are some days I think you could put a kayak out there and, and maybe have a good run of it. So we did all of this assessment looking at infrastructure um, and we came up with a number of plans that were vetted right here in this room, uh, as I said. And let me just um, move quickly to what we um, collectively called the preferred plan. And this was the pl plan that was presented to the select board, as I said, I believe it was in December of 2018. And what it did was it provided people with a, um, a plan that really looked at some fundamental things like dealing with the erosion on the site um, and the challenging topography. It created a plan that allowed people to move from one side of the common to the other. It increased the width of sidewalks, particularly on the hasting side, if you will, of the common. Um, and it came up with compromises to uh, creating uh, better parking uh, around the common on Boltwood. It did present some, um, some food for thought on direction of, of, of uh, traffic on Boltwood, but again, these were all concepts that were put out there. One of the central features of this plan is really celebrating uh, the town hall. And you can see in the upper right-hand corner of, of the, the, the North Common, this area that would double as both a parking area most of the time, but also an area that we could better present large gatherings. Uh, think Mary Maple, think extended uh, farmer's market, think any other gatherings that the town might want to do or uh, nonprofits might want to have on our North Common. It also presented spaces for just informal gathering throughout the, uh, throughout the common. And let me go through a couple of those. So these were some of the concepts that we came up with in our, in our various public meetings. Again, with a focus on activating the space, um, creating areas for sitting, for picnicking. Um, many people throughout the process referenced Pulaski Park in Northampton and the incredible job that Northampton did to transform that space. And I think if any of you have been there, you know what that can be eight or nine months of the year. We're looking for something like that in, in the heart of our downtown. This was a, a final image that was created by Weston and Sampson, really giving a sense of what kind of a, a meeting space, a lingering space, um, how we could activate the central part of the common while still retaining um, a great tree canopy, as well as um, spaces, just private spaces for quiet reflection, for having a picnic or reading a book. Um, and I think the preferred plan accomplished uh, all of that. So next steps really, uh, we hope to work with you to review the design that was presented back in the fall of 2018, to gather more community input, to really um, uh, uh, blow the dust off this plan a little bit, and then uh, ultimately present uh, all of those plans to you in a more formal way when we have a little bit more time. But all of this would be part of this package for downtown improvements. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, thank you, Paul, for the kind words. I'm 
now going to make you regret them. I brought a visual aid, um, and it's a, it's a parking structure because I don't have a lot of pretty pictures, um, and I'm not nearly as charming as the next speaker. So um, it probably will not have a, a car lift or anything like that. But no, parking is actually, it's a really serious issue. It's not um, nearly as much fun as uh, parks um, or playgrounds or, or uh, performing arts shells, but I think it's vitally important to our downtown. Um, at, at peak times, parking is near at capacity. Uh, the recent study showed that I think it's 7 p.m. on, on Saturday nights, it, it, it's at 86 uh, percent capacity, which really feels like it's at 100 percent capacity. Um, the future demand study also showed that over the next few years, parking demand is going to likely increase by up to 12 percent. Um, and the basic idea behind this proposal is that it's going to increase parking spots available to the public without an investment of private dollars. And the, the ideal location, I think, that, that staff has looked at and, and um, downtown property owners and, and stakeholders is sort of the lot behind Miss Saigon between uh, Pleasant Street and uh, North Prospect Street. Um, so I think that, you know, one of the strategies in the report itself was to look at a public-private partnership. This is a, a public parking lot right now owned by the town. It has 70 spaces. Um, you know, there's been some preliminary work done looking at the size of the lot and what could potentially be built and the topography of it and, um, you know, the. There's a, because of the hill and the structure, I think that there's a floor that can go in into the hill and be unseen and then potentially stories above it. Um, point out just the rendering up there is not uh, anything about this. I think that's a Smith College lot um, that, that's in Northampton, but it's just an idea of parking structures don't have to be um, monolithic things that are eyesores, uh, they can be done nicely. Um, so going back, we think that potentially there could be up to around 200 spots total. Um, right now there are less than 700 metered public spots in downtown. Um, so we're talking about a fairly significant increase, around 15% uh, parking spots. Um, and again, at this point, I think that what we're talking about is just exploring the opportunity and saying this is a piece of town-owned property. We think it's underutilized. Um, we don't think that public funds should necessarily be used in order to create a parking structure there, but can we put out uh, an RFP for a public-private partnership and see if the private sector thinks that it's worthwhile to do something? And I think that in such a, uh, an arrangement, uh, the town would have a lot of control over what the RFP looks like and could determine things like height um, and, and what it looks like, how many spots, public availability, things like that, and then see if there are interested parties who would come back and say, yes, we think we can make money and we think it could help the town and it could be a real win-win. Um, you know, one of the things I've heard since day one, and I think as people who have campaigned and, and been counselors for over a year, you've heard as well, is that um, parking is a challenge in Amherst. So next steps, the parcel is currently zoned uh, in, in a way that does not allow um, parking structures. So we would have to look at you know, either creating an individual overlay zone or something else um, that, that would allow a parking structure there. And then, obviously, a public procurement process, draft the RFP, tell the industry what we want, and then allow them to respond and, and come back to us with a potential solution. And I can pass this around. I brought some cars if people want to play while we finish up. But, um, I did not bring one for everyone, so I'm sorry. <laughs> So I just want to mention some things. This is just sort of an add-on to note that we are doing things downtown. We have been doing things downtown for a number of years, and we will continue to do things for downtown. So while I think your attention should rightly be on the projects that we just discussed, 
Uh, I do want to note that, you know, we received a significant multi-million dollar mass works grant where we were able to build, help build the roundabout, make the, put the utilities underground and install uh, crosswalks and um, new lighting. Um, we had, uh, we got a CDBG grant. We used some of our CDBG money to do the walkway uh, where next to the Unitarian Church. Uh, Amity Street with the crosswalk and uh, the parking lot uh, has been done. The main street from basically Town Hall uh, down to, to the um, Emily Dickinson House with new crosswalks, sidewalks, road repairs, that, that's been done. Uh, what's coming up is we received a grant to replace the Pleasant Walkway, which is um, the Starbucks walkway that has the, the deterioration and, and that along with some crosswalks uh, downtown will be done with grant funding. The, uh, you will see a request coming before the council to have a privately funded um, handicap access on in the public way for the visitor information center. Uh, and we'll be working on other improvements to sewer lighting, crosswalks and sidewalks downtown. Um, all that is to emphasize that we aren't looking just at public funds to make these changes. The, t the town has been looking for and has secured significant grants to make improvements to downtown. Uh, we, have, um, we are looking through the garage, a public-private partnership where we utilize an asset that the town has, i.e. the land, and, and secure funding and the investment by the private sector to build a parking structure that will um, address the parking need, but also, more importantly, address the perception of the need for parking downtown, which is m what has been identified over and over, and I think many of us feel it, that I'm not sure I'm going to find a place to park, so I don't want to go downtown. Um, and, the, um, and then the private commitment by uh, the Business Improvement District, which started a nonprofit, to raise a million dollars to put a structure on the on, on the um, common is a significant step forward and they are set and ready to go. But, uh, and then for the North Common, the jewel of the town downtown, uh, you know, activating that space, which is where we all walk through at different times and we, we have the reading of the human rights. We, there is the weekly um, vigil that takes place there. It's used all the time and it, it's an embarrassment, quite honestly, um, to to what we have there. Um, it should be the shining uh, uh, gem of, uh, of our entire town, but we, it, it just looks shabby and uh, we use the most important parcel to dedicate it to cars. And I think it's time to rethink how we do, how we think about that. That change with the um, addition of a parking garage should help allay, allay some of the fears that people have about removing parking downtown. So it's, there's a lot here, it's, it's ambitious. Um, not asking you to um, say yes or no to any of these. We understand that you're gonna want time. We also know that the public, one of the reasons for doing this tonight is so that the public can start to hear about these ideas, start to pay attention to them, start to weigh in so that the public has some time to digest what this all means, what, they, how this, what this means for the future of the downtown. And I appreciate that uh, the president has allowed time for the public who are here um, who would like to weigh in. Um, so um, so that, that's pretty much all I have to say. And we are here to answer your questions. Um, oh, did we get everything? Wait a minute, I didn't do everything. So here's, here's where we are. Kendrick Park already approved. Downtown improvements, we'll be doing that during the summer and the fall. Here's our schedule, rough schedule. It hasn't been confirmed by the president yet, but conceptually here's where we think we can be in terms of when we, when the, when we will be ready to present. It's the performing art shell in the February-March timeframe, the North Common and parking structure in the April-May timeframe. So that's the timeframe we would like um, this to come back to the council. Um, for you to go through your process, I know it'll have to go through a committee structure and uh, you'll have a lot of dis uh, discussions and decisions to, to make on these things, uh, but we're, we feel that we're ready to start acting and this is the year to make it happen. So that concludes our report. 
thanks to all of you who have made your presentations. We have both an opportunity for council discussion and comments and questions, and then we also have an opportunity with this agenda item for public comment. Uh, so let's begin with the council. Kathy. Uh, thank you very much. Um, as you know, we didn't get a chance to see this, or at least I don't think we got a chance to no. see this before it came. But what we did have at least a list of what might be on it. Um, what I, I think my overarching question is, I'd like to see it as a package with some price tags on it, mm -hmm. because we're also facing, as you know, some very tough decisions as we move ahead. And the one time I saw the North Commons, um, I may be lagged on this, but we had about a million dollars, but the design was calling for a $2 million project. Mm -hmm. So I don't know whether something can be brought in at a million dollars, you know, within a, a budget, you know, trying to think of how this works together. And so I, I don't know how you're thinking of getting sets of questions. So uh, the garage we built many years ago, Boltwood, was built so it could have upper stories put on it, and it was very expensive with the underground. So I, I just think a series of questions on uh, the location of it, the total cost, and if a private entity was running it, what kinds of parking fees might we be expecting? Is what Northampton's been really successful of starting on the higher side and but running it themselves and pulling down on the debt till now it gets less and less expensive. So just thinking of what that model. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's much easier to think of things together mm -hmm. the way you've presented them, them one by one. So I'm hoping we're gonna have that opportunity together. Um, and, and I would include the playground up in Kendrick Park too. I mean, what, what else are we thinking of Kendrick Park? Mm -hmm. um, because we could activate, we heard some very interesting ideas from other towns recently in Boston that were very low priced. Mm -hmm. um, so thinking of what we can do within our budget limits, um, short term versus longer term. The, those are all excellent questions. And when we get to the time to talk about them, you know, the pricing structure for the garage, all those things are not worked out. It's something we want to have the, the conversation with the council about. Additional comments from the council. Shalini. So I feel very energized by um, the proposal here in terms of not just a single project, but bringing these, uh, this collection of projects that can activate and re-energize our downtown. And I specifically want to speak to one idea picked up at the MMA, the municipal con uh, conference that we were at, which was about diversity inclusion, and it invited us to look at all our all the issues through the lens of diversity inclusion, and uh, just like we we're starting to do for climate change. And one of the things that comes up for me for having a performance shell right in the heart of downtown is that it makes it accessible. It makes art and culture accessible to so many more people who can't afford to go to Broadway or uh, fancy places. And it also invites people uh, who can't afford to, who are, who are artists, new artists who can't maybe uh, pay you know, expensive fees to rent locations, they could find a space to showcase their art and therefore have an opportunity. So I think this is really such a remarkable idea. I'm excited. Okay. Additional comments? Alyssa? A couple of things not entirely related. One is I'm a little <clears throat> chagrined to hear the concept that most of us are not proud of the North Common. Of course we're not proud of it, but it's not like any elected officials ever told town staff, ignore it. This isn't about what happened in Select Board in 2018. This is decades of not managing the mulch, decades of watching the trees get older, decades of watching the different enclosures that the kids love to play on around the trees deteriorating. And so those were not active decisions on any elected officials apart to say, just ignore that, we'll let that go. So one of the things we really need to hear about, and this has been a theme, I think, of this town council so far, as we're moving forward, and I know at least one of the projects mentions a maintenance fund for the band shell. We're, we're bad at that. We have a lot of really good people with really good intentions who don't have enough time to do everything. And 
that fell apart because choices were made not by elected officials to not keep that up. So we're going to really, I think, want to hear a lot about how that's going to be different moving forward every time we build something new because we really want to keep these things up so that we all can be proud of them. And then on a separate note, in terms of managing our expectations as to what we can expect to see, um, I do understand that we were told the general topics for tonight, as Kathy mentioned. We had no idea if we were going to be receiving detailed proposals or a really beautiful, somewhat uneasy making, but very beautiful, uh, slide presentation or if we were going to get two-page proposals on each of the reports. We knew nothing until we walked in the door tonight. So I appreciate what it turned out to be, that we didn't need to try and absorb the information. I'll also point out that all the town council part-time elected officials turned in all our reports before we went to MMA, so everybody had a chance to look at those before they left. So let's please continue with our focus on getting materials ahead of time for the next set of things that we get. So for February, we have stuff well in advance of that Monday meeting, so we have more time to ask you questions before we get here, et cetera, because I think it, this was great as a, as a wonderful introduction for everybody, but we, we had no idea what to expect coming in what level of introduction was going to be. And so if we can just get that managed better, like you can say, oh, you're only going to get this much information. And then we'll know how to budget our time. And so we can tell the public. Because we had people asking us, what's the proposal going to be? We're like, I don't know if there's going to be one or if it's just going to be a really great intro. Mm -hmm. So that helps us help the public. Additional comments? Yes, Steve. So I want to thank you for calling the North Common Project the North Common Project and not the North Common Main Street parking lot project, because it's really the North Common with parking on it that, in my opinion, should never have been put on it. So I'm also glad to see part of the package, a multi-story parking garage, very close proximity, which will address a lot of the concerns that people have expressed about the parking on our North Common. So that's, I think that was two points. And then my third point is exciting to see the two is the other common called the South Common or regular mm -hmm. common or South Common? Middle Common. Yeah. <laughs> the South, it's exciting to see the two. And so in some ways, the performing arts space on the regular common, South Common, might mean that the North Common might have to be less ambitious because mm -hmm. one of the plans I saw also had a band shell on the North Common or had a, uh, not a band shell, but a performing space mm -hmm. on it. So some of the big ideas for the North Common can be taken up by the South Common, and maybe that will help with budget mm -hmm. and other issues. Okay. okay, Sarah. So again, I do think a lot of these things are absolutely beautiful. Um, I think for someone who does go downtown a lot and whose kids like to go downtown a lot, and often it's so, um, I feel like the hardest part to get to at Amherst, especially on the weekends, is this north area. If you want to go just even pick something up at like Bueno Isano, I know that my family cannot find a place to park. Mm -hmm. And so what ends up happening is, is that one person runs to go get it, and the other person has to go, you know, we're talking about like maybe on Boltwood, like that behind part being one way. There's no way because you have to make a circle mm -hmm. in order to come pick somebody up again that extends that extends all of the downtown going past the uh, one bolt wood and it's that's the hard place to park and if you've got young children or you've have you've got your mom there who's in a wheelchair trying to get to that common and park or to even get to that side of town which is very busy there just isn't anything and i know maybe it's only a few parking spaces that we'll lose but to people who have such a hard time getting anywhere in there it's, it does really hit on people that we, it sort of seems like um, we're t being told two different things. One is we need complete streets. We want to be, you know, a walking community. And at the same time, you know, then we're building the, the parking garage. And I just, from a, a common sense point of view, I look forward to somebody like just showing me, Sarah, like this is the way traffic is going to flow or don't worry about that part in front of um, town hall because there's going to be parking somewhere close by there. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Additional comments? Yes, Dorothy. I'm excited by some of the ideas, 
but I am agreeing with Sarah that parking is a major, major problem, and certainly for handicapped accessible. Um, we have merchants complaining that people can't find a place to park. We have Amherst Cinema saying that people come from out of town and can't find a place to park. And I do agree that we do want to get rid of some of those parking places in front of Town Hall. But my, my vision is restoring historic green. As much, I think that it's going to take a lot of money. I mean, if, listen, from what I've heard about restoring an athletic field, to restore an eroded area with grass and trees that are young and living, and to put benches, benches and I, I love the idea of the passive uh, places to um, meet, walk, sit, read. Um, I think that's really appropriate. But, um, and I am a devotee of the performing arts and like to do them myself, but I would prefer to see the band shell, or not band shell, the performing arts space. On Kendrick Park, um, I went to the meetings and there seems to be space for that to happen. That is an active park. There will be bushes and trees and rocks and places that are nature, and, and when I was there we were all putting our dots on the plans that used boulders and uh, logs and looked not metal the whole way. Mm -hmm. But um, keeping the greens, the north and the south green, as simple and quiet as possible so that we, and then thinking about more parking. Also, I read a letter today from Grace Church. Um, there was, um, it's, I, I had never thought about the fact of what you need to have in front of a church in terms of hearses. Uh, that you have to have a certain kind of parking, that you have to have quiet, that you may have your programs that would be going on the same time as uh, other concerts. Um, there was a great concern. I just wish we hadn't lost the Spring Street parking lot. So if somebody has an idea of how to create a small parking lot downtown, that would be great. Uh, I'm, I do think that the parking lot that you're describing is going to be very welcome. Um, I just wanted to shift the entertainment a little bit uptown to Kendrick Park and to work at keeping a very quiet and green piece of nature. Mm -hmm. and, and we do remember, of course, that many big activities come in and put up temporary structures mm -hmm. on the parks. Mm -hmm. um, and I, we always go to them. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm glad when they're gone, too. Additional comments? Pat? Um, I really... Um, admire the transformation BID has done around the band stand, which it was originally, um, and moved it to a performing arts, a permanent performing arts stage. I think it will add to the life of the town and continue, uh, counter to what Dorothy is saying, continue the uh, engagement of citizens in performances, in festivals, in Taste of Amherst and the things like that. Um, I too am concerned because uh, I must have been at a select board meeting when the North Common plan was presented and I remember very much the Episcopal Church talking about the direction that they needed for hearses, et cetera. Uh, so I'm glad Dorothy brought that up. Um, I think that the new parking uh, possibility of really creating a, a public-private partnership will do a lot to alleviate and and we're talking, I think they, we're gonna lose 11 to parking spots um, with the North Common change. And if we were able to keep as many of the spaces as possible handicapped accessible that are there, um, it would be important. Mandy Jo. So I like the comprehensive plan in a way, um, but I do have some concerns, particularly about the shell. Um, so I'm gonna focus on that one. It is proposed to be on the town common, mm -hmm. which is a public way that is under our control, mm -hmm. um, with a proposal to be built by a private entity, so potentially a public-private partnership, but without any at this point, and I, I'm saying this so that hopefully we can get more specifics later on, on who owns it in the end, um, who the intended controlling entity on granting the reservation rights is, because um, right now that would be us. 
um, under our public waste policy, depending on how often it would fall to you as manager too. Um, but, but things like that, because if it is looked at as the bid built it, so the bid gets priority, I've got concerns about that. Um, you know, and so getting more information about what the operations of that would look like before any vote on design or anything comes to the council, I think is going to, for me, is going to be vitally important. Um, and I would personally like more information about, I know the Kendrick Park plan in that plan from the 2010s or earlier um, had a potential shell and band space included in it. And so I, you know, I'm kind of with Dorothy and all about what's the plan there. If that was the plan there, are we aiming for both ends? What are we aiming for comprehensively? Is the common the best spot in town? Um, our bid director said that when the businesses around the common are pulled, they say yes. But what about the businesses up by Kendrick Park? Mm -hmm. I'm sure they would rather have it at Kendrick Park. So I'm looking for more information as to what the best location for a shell is, not, well, Olmstead, you know, planned it that way, so that's what we have to do. Well, that's been 100 plus years. So <laughs> maybe given the development of our downtown, that might not be the most logical spot. So I would be looking for more information on that route, too, as we move forward on this. Thank you. Yeah. Additional comments? Uh, Evan. So I want to echo much of what was said about appreciating the comprehensive nature of this, connecting the dots between a number of different projects, and especially pairing them, especially since one project would involve removing parking um, and another would involve adding a significant amount of parking. Um, so my, my, my two comments, one has to do with the parking facility. Um, so that's something that I would like a little bit more information on how we move forward with that from a zoning perspective. There was a conversation, if it has to be rezoned versus an overlay, um, I know you're already intending to bring us that information, but getting that information in advance and knowing what the options are. Um, so instead of just saying, we want to do an overlay, um, it'd be nice to know if we don't do that, you could also rezone it, or perhaps there's you know uh, other options too. So, so understanding what our options are to move that forward, because um, I think it's really exciting uh, of a project, and I think as we're approaching these major capital investments, uh, the idea that we could get something, a big infrastructure project done as part of a public-private partnership is exciting, and, and perhaps a model for how we can do some of the other major investments that we have in front of us that we haven't even considered um, using public-private partnership model four. Um, the second thing would be the North Common project. Um, I think there's been a lot of work done on this, which is great. Um, I, I align, I think, a little bit more with where Steve is um, in that I'd like to see there be no parking on that common. I think that um, it's always been uh, an embarrassment to me that we have paved over sections of our historic common um, and that public space, I, I am always troubled by how much public space we reserve for the temporary storage of private vehicles um, accessible to some. And so I would like to see us reclaim some of that public space um, for the community um, and see if there are options perhaps on, on Boltwood to increase parking. Uh, we were just all in Boston and I noticed the uh, how common it was for diagonal parking on streets, if that's something that's an option to perhaps uh, maintain the number of spaces but take them completely off of the common. And so viewing this not just as the common but also as Boltwood and options there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Additional comments from the council? George. Just briefly, one of the, at least for me personally, the most moving things that, that I've done um, and we'll be doing again soon celebrate Black History Month is the reading of proclamations and the gathering of citizens. And uh, it works fine. We stand on the steps of town hall. Police keep traffic from running people over. Um, but it, it seems that we might consider this space in the North Common um, as a place for that to take place, a gathering place for those kinds of events. Um, so uh, that's something I'd like us to keep in mind. The performance part, perhaps in the South Common, but, um, and the quiet space in the north is fine, but I'd like to think that we could um, somehow in the planning create a space where 
um, when we do these kinds of proclamations and people gather, um, there would be a designated space where we don't have to be worried worry about being run over or uh, things like that. Additional comments from the council? Shalini? I'm sorry, Darcy, you have not spoken yet. Um, yeah. I just um, have a, a few comments. One is um, I would like to see how this whole plan um, fits together with our other capital requests. Mm -hmm. You know, I, ideally I'd love to see a spreadsheet of all of our potential capital requests and how much each costs and so that we could rank them, so that we could prioritize them against each other. Mm -hmm. um, I'd also like to know how um, sustainability generally and climate action will be integrated into whatever it is that we're proposing here, because um, we're going to be having a climate action plan completed sometime in the next few months. and. Hopefully everything is going to be integrated into that. And lastly, I'd kind of like, since this is um, clearly, uh, it's going to, you know, if some of these things were done, they'd benefit the town, they'd benefit the residents, but they'd, they would especially benefit the downtown businesses. It would be nice to include in a package like this, you know, something the businesses together could offer, um, such as, um, a plan to compost all of the restaurant's food waste in a program where it would go to be used in local farms or something like that. Um, or using compostable containers or, you know, something that the local business community could offer in exchange for town council. Not in exchange, but. <laughs> um, no quid to, pro to, quo. To sweeten, <laughs> to sweeten the pot. <laughs> Um, so, uh, yes, those are my comments. Additional comments? Shalini? I agree with my counselor, uh, co-counselor, whatever, colleague, <laughs> however you say that. Um, it's trying to be all formal. But anyway, uh, I agree that we need more information about the ownership and so forth of the performance shell. Uh, regarding the reservations, I think we as a council need to have a conversation about do we want to be the ones who are making reservations like artists emailing us and or coming here and it seems like that's going to be too cumbersome and time consuming for us as a council to be doing the reservation so I would be very happy to pass that on to the bid or whoever is willing to do that. However, as a council, we could come up with criteria that we can provide to them that guides them in what sort of programming and so forth. Uh, but that's something I think that as a council, we need to have a discussion on and then provide the guidelines to, to the bid. Okay. Additional comments? I'd like to make one or two. Uh, first of all, I really want to express my appreciation to both the town manager, your staff, and the business community for coming forward together. I think that sets a tone that allows us to look at this from the very beginning as a partnership. And it is not to be uh, seen as something minor. Uh, this is the beginning of a very, very important discussion for us when the town council met in its retreat uh, back about almost a year ago now, um, we actually identified downtown as one of our three top priorities. And it continues to be a priority that many councillors have extraordinary interest in. Some people themselves have businesses downtown, and clearly all of us have spent a whole lot more time downtown since we've been elected to office and we get to see it in its many, many different forms. So while I'm not gonna get into whether or not the parking fee should be here, we do have to look at this in light of our many, many um, demands on our capital and on our land. And, uh, but at the same time, I, really hope that we can find a way to weave forward, as we often have been doing, and come to an acceptable solution that will uh, enhance our downtown so that it brings both businesses and our residents down here. So with that, let's go to public comment. Who would like to speak? 
Let's start over here and please come forward. We are gonna limit you to three minutes unless it gets to be a lot. And uh, please state your name and where you live. Uh, David Mazur, uh, 27 Woodlot Road in Amherst. Um, I'm also a property owner uptown at 3739 South Pleasant Street. Uh, I know there's a lot of talk about the North Common. Building we own is right across from the North Common. The Main Street parking lot is just about the most heavily used parking lot in Amherst. It's in line of sight of many, many businesses that rely on that parking lot. I have gone around, I've talked to 24 businesses. They are all appalled at the idea that the town would even consider removing those parking spaces because parking is their number one concern. Not all parking uh, is exchangeable. If you're gonna go get to the barber shop, uh, you're not necessarily gonna park way behind CVS. You can't look at these things as just interchangeable. A lot of the businesses, Russell's Liquors, or a lot of the restaurants, um, they rely on people being able to just park, come in, go to Glazed Donut, go to Russell's Liquor. That's how people use that parking lot. Um, our building, the building next to our building, and the building next to that have not a single private parking space. There's two restaurants, one of which just expanded and doubled in size. If you go all the way down Main Street, it's lined with restaurants. These are very high traffic businesses. And they, as we know, lunch times on weekends, that lot is full. You know, this, uh, this holiday season, I was shopping at Amherst Books, and I actually, just by coincidence, was at the register at the same time as one of the town councilors. And I mentioned, you know, the idea, like, you know, I hope we're not gonna be losing any parking. And I am for beautifying the North Common. I mean, that's a worthy goal. What somehow has gotten involved here is the idea that, you know, removing parking that is needed in our central business district. So I'm standing there with, with this town's counselor and I turn to the people at Amherst Books and I say, are you guys in favor of removing some of these parking spaces? And they're like shocked. Now I've gone around and talked to, their reaction was, take it away, we need more parking. More parking where people can just come right in the door. If you talk to Clay's, they will tell you a lot of their uh, customers are older. They're not going to walk from far away. If they do not see a space, they drive on. So, you know, this parking, to go to Black Sheep, to go to Lone Wolf, to go to Amherst Barbers, it is critical to them. If you're going to have a farmer's market on the Spring Street lot, and you're going to take away half the spaces where people park to go shopping at that, you're just adding to the pressure. So I ask you to consider that the beautification is a worthy project, um, but I think it needs to be confined to its current uh, footprint. And then you can think about ways maybe you can beautify a little bits of that space. It may not be the most beautiful, but it is essential for our downtown businesses. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Are there, I'm going to ask that at this point, we continue on the theme of the parking. Sharon? This is on. Sharon Povinelli, 45, oh no, uh, 493 Montague Road. Um, I, first, I'd like to say I have the utmost respect for my fellow downtown business owners. Um, it's hard out there. I'd just like to throw that out. Um, we all have our own unique set of challenges and complexities, um, but I, we obviously intersect around people and parking and how that translates into a lasting business and a vibrant downtown. Um, having said that, <clears throat> as an abutter to the North Common, I would like to voice my support for the decrease and or relocation of the Main Street lot. Um, this is the epicenter of the downtown. 
and should be allowed to be imagined as a safe space that attracts families, visitors, and students to enjoy the downtown and showcase what we as a community have to offer. Let's hide the parking and promote the parks. Thank you. Okay. Additional comment, Carol, please. Hello, I'm Carol Johnson. I'm the executive director of the Amherst Cinema. And I'm here to make a couple of points. Um, one is that we already have a very vibrant artistic community in our midst, and that is with, with hu uh, some humility, <laughs> the Amherst Cinema. We screen over 275 programs a year. That's 5,000 different screenings in more than 25 languages. And we attract people from all over. I'm going to pass around a map which has red dots that represent our members. We have over 6,700 members who come from all over Massachusetts. Thank you. Um, parking is the number one concern of the Amherst Cinema and of our patrons. So my main request for, to you is, as you're thinking about what to propose going forward, please keep the vision that we've got something already that we should value, and it depends upon parking. And it, one parking space taken away actually affects maybe three programs a day because people come for two or three hours. And if that parking space is removed, then it's um, that parking space times three that's not available to people. Um, just one final point, and that is we attract about 110,000 people a year to Amherst Cinema. That's 2,000 people a week. That's a, lot of, that's a lot of people who come downtown and spend their dollars and want to park. Uh, so as you're thinking about what to do going forward, please think about the long term and what, what we already have and how we can preserve what we do have. All right. Thank, Thank you, you for your comments. Additional comments on parking. Let's go by back here. Hi, um, Leslie Eric. I, my, my parents live in Amherst. I no longer, but we have a business, a family business at 37 South Pleasant Street. Is the mic on? Or? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, I, I, I have a couple of comments. One is that the, to, to remove parking spaces from the parking lot in the, in the center of town seems like an outlandish idea if you have not already put more parking spaces in. So, so I would hope that if, if you decide to go forward with these plans that you would absolutely add before you subtract because to take parking spaces away is extremely frustrating. Um, we pay for... Um, the downtown parking permits for our employees, and uh, I guess there's no limit on the downtown parking permits for people who live and work in the center of town, because even though we pay for those uh, every year, uh, our employees, uh, including me, we end up having to park at metered spaces anyway, because there aren't enough spaces. So, like, to remove more of those in the center of town seems foolish. Um, and also, there already is a parking garage behind Judy's, um, and I remember when it was built, and I remember that the intention was to have it be multi-storied, and I wonder if anybody knows why that didn't happen. Um, oh, please. 
Don't go there. <laughs> Do not go okay, there. Okay, well, that's just like a half-finished idea that like now didn't work out, and I just feel like there might be other half-finished ideas that aren't going to work out and are going to... You know, like maybe don't take stuff away until you have like a real clear plan and, and something else there to replace the things that you're trying to take away. And also, um, are they going to cut down the nice, big, old, beautiful trees on the North Common in order to reclaim that green space? Because I, I would strongly object to cutting those trees down. Those are, those are sort of like the nicest part of that area. And, you know, if you're going to build something new, I mean, can you guarantee that it's going to be maintained since the things that are there now are not being maintained? What would be the difference? You know, who's going to be in charge of maintaining new structures, new buildings, new band shells? Um, is, is there no, is it the, the parking garage that already was started, that's not something that can ever be uh, expanded? We're not going to comment at this time. <laughs> okay. I, that's because that's our rule with public comment. Okay. Okay. Well, just, you know, I would hope that you would add before you begin subtracting. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. The gentleman back here. Please state your name and your address. Uh, it's uh, Jeremy Austin and 75 Northeast Street. Um, I just wanted to comment on the parking. Um, I am all in favor of, I have a business at 31 South Pleasant Street right on the Common um, and uh, have looked at the North Common for quite a long time and it's, uh, it's decrepit state. But anyway, uh, I think we're getting to an argument where, uh, you know, might have you might have had in Northampton 30 years ago you know of course we you know uh, how are we going to survive with you know a parking lot and everybody using a parking lot well everybody uses the parking lot there it's a, it's a place where you can always find parking and it frees up more of the street parking um, if we are to put uh, parking in the CVS lot the natural spot in town it's actually very close uh, to the theater, uh, would add hundreds of spots, and the 15 or so spots that would be lost on the North Common would be inconsequential, which is a, a, a decent walk from there to the cinema, and it's not appreciably further behind the Jones Library, straight shot. Uh, the other thing about it is that if we were having this argument and there was no parking there, it would be absolutely absurd. There's no way we could ever get it passed where somebody said, let's dig up a part of the common but put 15 spots on it. I mean, I, I, why are we even having the conversation? That just would not happen. So let's reverse the past and, and do the right thing and put grass there and make it a beautiful place. And I will take all day long uh, a beautiful town center with lots of programming on the common and I'll take the 25 people who want to come through this town and are excited to be in this town to the one person who's bitter about not finding a parking place when they drive through. Thank you for your comment. Thank you. Vince, please come forward. Vince O'Connor, Summer Street. Um, yeah, so we did a parking garage X number of years ago, uh, net gain of 30 to 40 spaces for $6 million. Hopefully, uh, a new garage will do a little better on the per space thing. Um, the shell on the, on the uh, middle common, because the south common is really at Amherst College. Um, if you really want to make it functional, you're going to have to end parking enforcement at 6 o'clock if you're going to have programs at night. Um, and with regard to the, the parking permit situation, the council can find out f for itself. I could make a public records request. But my, my belief is that the last time I looked, there were somewhere between two and a half to three times as many permits that were granted as there are uh, permit spaces. And of course, the situation with creating five-story buildings with no parking spaces 
as is about to happen on Spring Street, like literally not a single parking space, uh, not even an HP space uh, on the property or a, um, a zip car space, um, is it may work during the, the, the weekdays, but on the weekends when those uh, when those spaces are open to everybody um, and people park their cars, you are inviting, you have invited a, a serious problem. The only good thing about those buildings is they're basically luxury apartments that are occupied by most people if you can drive by during the summer and uh, during the winter term uh, for seven months of the year. So you may luck out. Um, but my concern when I'm listening to all this and seeing all these proposals is that I ran for school committee starting twice, starting more than 10 years ago, who's, and my first priority was to deal with uh, re renovating our schools. And if I'm a citizen who's paying really enormous taxes, and I live in an apartment, so my taxes aren't that enormous, or my share of the rent that goes to taxes aren't that enormous. But if I'm listening to and looking at all this discussion, and I have kids in schools, and I'm wondering when the town says, well, you can't build a new school to have an override or you, till we get state funding, and yet all our 90s projects are out of the capital budget. Now, there is money available. We could have renovated the school or rebuilt or replaced one, at least one of our elementary schools and we haven't done it. And quite frankly, I think that that's going to be a problem for these proposals to fund things um, when you're also doing all of this. Thank you for your comment. Are there any other public comments regarding the presentation? Yes, I'm sorry. Could you just ask people, remind people to please sign in? Thank you. Make sure that you have signed in back there, be if particularly, or up here, particularly if you have been a public speaker. Um, please come forward. Claudia Pasmani, Executive Director of the Amherst Area Chamber, and also resident 47, Emily Lane. Um, so as representative of the, of the chamber, I submit the following remarks. Um, our 2020 vision was unveiled this week, and it included activation of downtown, supporting the survival of businesses downtown, creating experiences, and playing a larger role in our creative and culture economy, all contributing and supporting to this destination Amherst that was described in detail. Firstly, the Performing Art Shell proposal made by the bid offers a private option to have a public space made available, and it comes at a time when our small businesses downtown, and similarly across the country, are facing their toughest challenges. The diversion to online shopping, coupled with the loss of handing down business from generation to, get to generation, we, start, we need to get creative. And this is not news to anyone, but this is an opportunity to reimagine our downtown. We know that our rising generation responds to experiences created. We need to be innovative while holding true to an old tradition of gathering in our common space for all. In addition, the creative, the creative culture economy represents $2.3 billion impact, dollar impact on our state, according to the Mass Cultural Council. Culture embraces everyone, as Shalini pointed out. It enriches community, drives growth and opportunity, and empowers a new creative generation. And based on all the diverse groups mentioned in Gabrielle's comments, it would be open for all. And there are even studies who suggest that those who experience arts and culture steadily are healthier and live longer. So imagine a Tanglewood-style concert to student performances from jazz to poetry, film to concerts, and like she says, mommy-to-be <laughs> to, local, to local school venues. This is the only way we can activate our downtown or, or together in combination with these efforts to, to create destination Amherst. The parking garage proposal made by the bid offers again a private public option made available at a time when we were at a peak crisis with a number of capital improvements needing to be made. 
and it could alleviate some of that pressure. Though the Nelson Nygaard parking studies demonstrate that we are nearly at capacity, we hear from our downtown business owners, when are you going to fix downtown parking? And I've heard from individuals from across the region, when are you going to address downtown parking so I can come back downtown? And I've heard it from residents alike who work elsewhere and don't come downtown to eat. So this is, this is lost revenue and a partial answer to the why of empty storefronts. Both the Amherst Cinema and Jones Library may have plans for expansion. The proposed site of the parking garage would directly support any vision for that, for both of these two Amherst cultural beacons alone. In addition, there's an increase of new development already. We saw the 12% increase um, that Jeff mentioned. So more reasons to support a parking garage proposed by the downtown bid. Okay, I'm just gonna close up, and just in closing, with a parking garage op option and a performing art shell, a North Common Rehab is in perfect alignment with these upgrades, and again, as a compelling fit to the total project. Um, and, and in completing the vision for Amherst as a destination. We have maturing and aging trees, little space to truly gather and welcome over 500,000 guests who come to our museums alone. So it may seem a hard balance when looking at each proposal, but looking at the big picture, these are wins for downtown Amherst businesses and will serve as a true economic driver for the future. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comments. Tony? Tony Marulis to break court, 01002. <laughs> um, uh, I'm a, a member of the bid board, um, and I just wanted to make uh, four quick points um, as you think about these projects. Um, first, uh, parking and the activation uh, or, or the loss of parking on the North Common. One, one thing to note, uh, the busiest restaurant night of the year happens to be Mary Maple year in and year out. That is the time that we take parking away from the North Common, we activate that, that space. Um, it is not to say necessarily that you know the, the proposal in front of you takes away some of the parking space, but activating that streetscape um, has actually been very beneficial to the town. Additionally, um, thinking about the bandshell on the common, um, activation of the common and regular programming on the common does not necessarily preclude additional programming in Kendrick Park or in Sweetser Park. As you might know, Sweetser Park uh, twice a year has uh, the Amherst Community Band that plays there. Um, Kendrick Park has been the site of at least one concert and other art events, and with a playground there, that would be active as well. So as we think about um, our green space in town, we're blessed to have for spaces that can be used. And when they're used and used vitally, um, it brings me to my fourth point, so I'm gonna skip my third one for a sec. Uh, the quick trips into, well, quick trips into town are difficult. One of, the thing that the bus one of the things that the business community has always struggled with is stickiness. We lose people very quickly. People come to their destination and they go. One of the things that's made places like Northampton successful over the years is that ability to lounge and to be um, in town for a while to do some window shopping. We will encourage that by activating our spaces. So it's just one thing to think about as we look at all of these, these uh, plans and how they work well together. And then finally, um, to Councillor Haneke's uh, question about the structures on the common um, and who owns them. There is precedent, and I just wanted to point this out. It's not to say that this would be how the, com the band shell would work, but there is precedent for um, other structures on the town common that were owned by other entities. So when I was executive director of the chamber, uh, we owned the electricity on the common. Uh, we gave that to the town uh, because we, we didn't have the money to upgrade what the town uh, did do under, um, I'm gonna give Guilford Mooring a big shout out there because he did a great job with that. Um, but we own that, we owned that electricity, we rented out that electricity for a nominal fee. Uh, just so that we could pay the bills on it on a regular basis. I mean, I, I think that, you know, whoever does run that, that band shell will need to have some revenue only to, for the maintenance of. Um, and that, that's one thing. The, the other piece to remember is that there was that additional info shack um, that was on the common for many, many years. And, and it uh, served as our visitor information uh, center, if you will. Um, before it was uh, taken down because it was in disrepair. But there, so, you know, some of your thoughts about you know, keep having a fund to ma maintain, that will be certainly important, but there is precedent for 
um, structures to be owned and to work cooperatively with the town. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for your comments. Are there any other comment at this time? Please come forward. My name is Bob Lowry. I live at 1739 South East Street. And um, I have a business next to the uh, north end of the common. And um, <clears throat> my experience, uh, well, it's, it's a restaurant, Bueno Isano, uh, which was mentioned. Thank you. And I, and I appreciate your uh, <laughs> chiming in there. Um, and uh, however, in unintuitive this may seem. Uh, I think that um, I agree with the idea that uh, activating the space, um, quote unquote, um, would probably bring additional business um, to our restaurant. Um, <clears throat> my, my perception, it, it's only that, but is that the parking is, is difficult at, um, peak times uh, only. I, I drive in and out of town every day, park. Um, not as much in the evening, I'll have to say, but uh, my perception, uh, at least in the daytime, and uh, most of the time is that we're really talking about Friday nights, Thursday nights, maybe you know Saturdays, um, in the evenings when everybody wants to be out to dinner or something like that, and I, and I uh, I just think that's interesting is that we, I, can, I can find a space anytime except for peak times. Um, and the, you know, Congress does stuff with bills and you put stuff in there and you get what you want maybe. Um, I, I like the idea that, uh, that was, you know, brought up that if, if we were able to add a significant place for parking, I think that would alleviate some of the pressure in the surrounding areas um, and that if that could be um, if that could be put into place uh, maybe not you know or at least uh, in the budget and going to happen then I think that uh, this idea of um, eliminating a few spaces downtown right where we are would be much more palatable um, and more well received and I think that perceived parking is uh, um, just as much an issue as actual parking. And I think if there were an additional large space um, that went together with this other proposal to activate the common area, I, I, would, I would like to see that. So thank you. Thank you for your comment. Is there anybody else who would like to speak to the issue of the proposed set of plans that we have been introduced to tonight? Um, then I'm going to turn back to the council, but quickly say we have yet, I have yet, and with you I will work on this, to figure out how to couple and decouple this so that we look at the issues we need to look at and then also look at the whole. And I'll spend some time with the town manager on that and also welcome the council's comments on how they would like us to consider that. Um, this package and yet the individual pieces of it. Are there any other comments from the council at this time? Alyssa. Two quick things toward the future presentations whenever they come up because you'll be getting lots of individual questions from people, sure. et cetera. So I believe there was a mention and so that can just be followed up on when we were discussing the band shell that there's currently less usage of the common than in the past and if that's true, then what is it that we're missing? Is, are there fewer kid events because there are fewer kids in town? Are there fewer events than there used to be with bands, but now bands want electricity? I mean, if, if we're going to make a statement like that, I'd like to know what that represents and if it's Thank based you. purely on reservations, et cetera. And then the other thing is that just a whole like uh, question about parking, mm -hmm. which is that Yes, someday I'm sure we'll be talking about the six o'clock or eight o'clock enforcement again. But I would like us to reevaluate what it is that makes it special that when people want to go to downtown town hall during the day, or they want to go to the common for a free event on a Saturday or the farmer's market, they have to pay to park. But after six o'clock, hey, if you want to patronize a business, it's free. I have no understanding 
of why the U.S. thinks this is a sensible way to manage things. There are businesses that are only open until 5 p.m. You have to pay to park to go see them. There is no such thing as free parking for them. So I would just hope that when we have those kinds of conversations, we're thinking about what kinds of businesses we're trying to reinforce. Some have their own parking lots like Hastings, others do not. And to try, maybe that's a regional thing within our little town, but to be thinking about what is it that makes it great to charge people to park during the day, but not at night. Okay. Are there any other comments from counselors at this time? Dorothy. Well, I would just suggest a common sense thing that we try to do an immediate zoning change and get rid of this idea that we don't, that people can build apartments and don't need to provide parking for their tenants because we have a bus system. I mean, that has helped exacerbate the parking system in town. And I, you know, I, I just think it's a common sense thing since we're talking about common sense. Thank you. Any other comments at this time? Shalini? Lynn, I'm not clear what, what, what are the next steps for, with respect to this? Are we waiting for more information and then, I mean, I think it would be helpful for everyone involved to know, you know, how, yeah, what are the next steps? I think that the best thing that I can answer at this time is to come back with you with a way to lay that out. Uh, because there are different pieces that we have to bring forward, for example, rezoning of the lot behind CVS, and that's a separate issue. So that's part of the couple and decouple and put it into some kind of timeline. I don't have a magic answer for you, okay? Just to add to that conversation, um, and I don't expect an answer on this, um, thinking about the, the council's role for the performing arts venue um, is to authorize the use of the public way. Um, I think in my mind there's a question of which comes first um, because I think to some extent there might be some reticence on the council to authorize the use of a public way for say a performing arts venue that is not fully funded or that we haven't seen a design for. Uh, the other side of it is I know that if I was being asked to donate money to a performing arts venue um, and I was told that it would all be dependent on a council that I may or may not know authorizing use of the property, I may be hesitant to vote. Um, and so I think there needs to be some conversation that if we're relying on private fundraising for any of these, um, that in the same way that we sort of pre-authorize the town manager to act um, on the community choice aggregation stuff so that we could have good faith with our partners, we may want to consider something similar in that um, so that we, can, we show up front, we're ready to do this if you can raise the money as opposed to waiting to doing it at the back end. Okay, all right, Steve. Yeah, so I see the proposed parking concentration the same way I see the water tanks up on the high parts of Amherst. That the reasons that the water tanks are there is to provide municipal water in certain parts of Amherst so that development can happen more sensibly. So that's how I see the proposal for the multi-story garage behind CVS. It's so that we can have other sensible development, frankly, without parking, um, more walkable communities. So that's why I am in, in generally in support of this sort of back, you know, um, back lot, I mean, it's front lot if you live on North Pleasant, that's to be discussed, but um, back lot at least to whichever Pleasant, <laughs> whichever Pleasant that is. So it's a municipal resource, it's a concentration of a resource to enable the nearby entities to not provide parking. Okay. Are there additional comments from counselors at this time? Seeing none, then I'm going to suggest we take a break, even though I had not intended to do that till 8.30. And when we come back, we will take up action item 7B and maybe even C before we move on to the Board of License Commissions. Please make the break no more than about five minutes if possible. Thank you. Um, as some of you may know that on January 6th, we had a little connection problem for the second half of the meeting and Amherst Media worked very hard and did restore the tape, but it took a little while. So we're 
trying to make sure we're still connected. All right, Jeff, why don't you come forward since we're gonna do bylaws and this is our opportunity to, you know, say whatever else we might wanna to say to you. I did not bring props for this. If you did, it would have been reams of paper at this point. And lawnmowers, lawnmowers plastic bags, etc. I'm waiting for two people, but okay. So as I mentioned, let's get through the bylaw stuff and then we'll spend just a little bit of time um, saying whatever we might like to say to Jeff about his future. But um, meantime, uh, I, I just love dangling it out there, you know? Um, we've had a number of conversations about the general bylaws and the approach we're proposing to use tonight in fact, we're planning to use tonight, is instead of sitting here and debating each of the bylaws that people have asked for changes to, is to in fact refer it to GOL. And this would allow us to meet our timeline of uh, replace and repeal, or repeal and replace, and also meet our timeline of dissolving the bylaw review committee. We need to do this because Jeff's leaving town. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> I think we shouldn't dissolve it because we need it here. There you go. Okay. Um, so in the process, there are a couple of motions. In fact, there are four motions specifically about the bylaws. And then I also just want to, um, our four or five motions, I think. Actually, six motions, thank you. Uh, but I also want to point out that there are other items that were already being referred and that this, those are already automatically referred. This is, we need to have a motion on those two. That's, okay, got it. All right, so let's just begin with the first motion is to repeal and replace the general bylaws with the document recommended general bylaws of the town of Amherst dated 1206-19. Is there a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Conversation, discussion, questions. Dorothy. Darcy. It wasn't you? No okay, saying. Darcy, I'm sorry. I mean, I just um, this. How? How would this motion affect the, the later motions that are um, referring different sections to the GOL committee? So what this first motion allows us to do is to take the recommendations as made by the committee, accept those so that we have in place an ongoing set of general bylaws with the changes that they recommended, okay? And at the same time, refer to GOL the four particular areas of the bylaws that, that counselors have asked that there be changes on. And in addition, the additional pieces that have been asked already to be automatically referred. So all it, it, what it does is it gives us a set of general bylaws that have been, in fact, revised, but still leaves open for future revision in the near future, possibly. Why don't we do it um, with the exception of those sections? Because you need the bylaw. If there is a bylaw in there, you need it in there. Otherwise, you would remove the bylaw completely, and I don't think you want to do that. So in other words, you would remove the plastic bylaw completely 
I don't think you want to do that. I, I also have my hand up. Just I, I want to clarify, Lynn, um, in terms of I've got a couple on others, but it seems to me one could leave the existing wording as is in the new revised um, rather than leave it blank and remove it altogether. I mean, that is an option. I mean, it, it might not be an option that we want to consider, you know, that we're going to... that that some wording was cleaned up and it reads cleaner and we are, but there's a placeholder. Mm -hmm. So I, as I understood it, Darcy had given us a rewrite for the, the single use plastics as an amendment to the revisions that have been made. So it's just not clear to me that we have to literally delete it and be silent on it okay. as opposed to keep the unrevised version of it. Mandy Joe. While we don't have to, the motion language could get very complicated very quickly because the new bylaws have a different numbering system than the old bylaws and they did not track over accurately. So to make a motion to replace all but certain ones and then keep other ones from that and then add in a new number, it would get very complicated. That doesn't mean it's not possible, but it would probably take us lots of minutes tonight to figure out how to actually word that. Um, but the, from my point of view, the benefit of this, and I have, I have one of the, the requested changes that is being affected by this. In fact, it's going into effect if we do this, and I want it to be repealed. So I'm, it is actually almost opposite what you guys are talking about with some of yours, um, is that we as counselors, if we do it this way, we have some counselors that have identified certain things that we're not happy with in a huge rewrite of it and are saying, Let's do the huge rewrite, but let's use our committee process that we have in place to really delve deeply into those portions of that rewrite that we still have concerns about without holding up the adoption of pretty much everything. Um, and, to, and that to me makes logical sense. So, you know, I, you know, mine was the noise bylaw where I don't like the fact that the bylaw review committee added in new restrictions to noise bylaws and new places you can violate it. Um, this, this plan tonight would adopt that new restriction before the council has really had a good discussion on whether that's wise or not and would move that initial first discussion into a committee, which kind of follows what any other bylaw revision that we do from now on, that's how it would happen. Um, going to a committee, having that discussion, coming back with a re recommendation with appropriate wording in my motions and all of that. And so this is kind of trying to follow that process. Darcy. It seems to me that it wouldn't take us that long to um, uh, come up with a recommendation from the GOL on the four different um, sections that are that have requests for changes and I don't really understand why we would need to um, replace the bylaw pending that it we makes you know it's, it's similar to our issue around uh, updating the master plan or, you know are we going to vote to adopt the master plan, even though we know it has many, many issues that need to be updated, well, we, we are not going to do that. Um, we're, we're waiting for the update. So I just don't understand why we wouldn't do that here, why we wouldn't just wait for a month or six weeks or whatever to replace the bylaw pending just updating, making whatever changes that we're going to make as a result of these motions, these other motions with regard to Alyssa. issues. So two things. One is in regards to that, I guess I just repeat what Mandy Joe said, which is that 
this is the cleaner way to do it. I understand the words you're saying about the master plan, but if you accept a new bylaw and then you send the sections off to GOL you want done, then they fix them as quickly as they can and get them back to us. And in the meantime, you have a clean bylaw instead of this old messy bylaw. <coughs> Along those lines though, I believe I heard in your introduction and maybe I didn't hear it correctly. You said something about automatic referral. Nothing in this is an uh, maybe. So we're missing a motion from last time we talked about this yes. on today's motion sheet. We had a motion that said, the motion didn't mention that we were going to have all these other things, of course, but the motion said to refer the document bylaws identified for future consideration it's the third. to GOL. That doesn't seem to have made today's motion. It's sheet. the third motion on the list that includes adding the, the condo version. and cooperative, blah, blah, blah. The one with the bullet points, it's oh, in there. Oh, we combined motions yeah. instead of, okay. Was that motion then intended to cover all these things? Because we seem to have some separate motions and some combined motions. So I'm very confused by that. Evan. So I certainly have some comments on some of the other motions and some questions about what GOL's uh, purposes in this. Um, but I think before we branch off into that, it makes sense for us to deal with the motion that's on the table and then talk about these motions separately. I don't think we ever put the motion on the table. We did. Okay. Who was the second? Okay. All right. Could we have the motion sheet up here so that we can see them? Thank you. Okay, so the motion on the table is to repeal and replace the general bylaws with the document recommended general bylaws of the town of Amherst dated 12-06-19. Further comment? Kathy. Okay, I, I just want to um, respond to the notion that this is cleaner. Um, if, these, if I were in wearing a federal legislator hat and someone gave me major changes in, to multiple sections of the Medicare law and said, don't worry, I've taken some language out and I've added some language in, just accept all the changes now and we can come back and look at each of those later, I would be really worried. Um, so I, I don't think, I think it's easier for the reasons Mandy said because the previous language had a different wording, you know, it had a different style. So um, I think um, my sense, and I actually am ag gonna agree with the one on noise, I would just take the sentence out. So I think we're trying to avoid a long discussion now, which I appreciate that. But we've flagged four things, so is there some certainty that each of those four things will be reported back sooner rather than later. Because in one case, we're eliminating a bylaw altogether. In another, we're adding words. We've taken words out of one, and we've taken words out of another. So if the concerns are shared by other counselors, I just would want rapid action rather than leave a bylaw in place in the town that's missing some things that we might want or added some things we might not want because normally you'd be voting on each of the bylaws. I mean, that's how they were all enacted, law by law by law. That's, it's a set of laws. So I, I just don't, you know, how do we have assurance Is, that this happens? When we pass the other motions, we can put dates certain on them. Voting on this motion first, suppose the other motions don't pass. Okay, we can hold this motion in abeyance and go on to the others. That's what I'm not liking. It's on the table. Would somebody I'm like to not, withdraw the motion? I'm not trying to stall on here. I'm just saying that this okay. is, it's uh, I, I got it, Kathy, okay. Would you withdraw the motion? So it wasn't my motion to withdraw. I only seconded it, but if we don't do the repeal and replace first, then the motions that follow don't actually make sense because exactly they right. are referring then to the current bylaws, not the revised exactly. ones. So it really has to go repeal and replace yep. first. Thank you. I, I kept thinking to myself, there's gotta be a reason we have to do this one first. Is there any further discussion? 
D Darcy. I, I just would like to ask the question, what's the urgency? Why do we need to do this? We have a charter requirement that within one year of appointing the bylaw review committee, which was at the end of January 2019, that we adopt the revised bylaws. We are at the end of January 2020. I'd like to talk about another urgency. There are many councillors working on potential bylaw revisions to bylaws being proposed, but also additions to bylaws with whole new groups of bylaws to propose. And without a rescind and replace in place now, those all that work is on hold because you're not going to put them into an old set of bylaws that then needs to modify this whole document. And so there's been councillors waiting for this rescind and replace to happen so that they can propose new bylaws to be enacted by this council and for discussion. And so if we do not do that and we hold it off till all these potential issues are discussed at, and figured out by GOL and brought back and that's decision, that's another two, three months of our three year term that's already one year plus two months gone that we cannot really actually deal with legislative matters that councilors want to bring to this council. Okay. Is there any further discussion? Then I'm gonna call the question. All those in favor of the motion to repeal and replace the general bylaws with the document Recommended general bylaws of the town of Amber stated 12-06-19. Please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Opposed. Abstain. So it's three zero. I'm sorry, eleven zero two. Okay. And the motion passes. The second motion is to dissolve the bylaw review committee, because now that we have taken their recommendations, they are finished with their job. Is there a motion? George? I move to dissolve the bylaw review committee. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor, I'm going to call the question. All those in favor of dissolving the bylaw review committee, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> First of all, that motion passed 1300, and I do want to take the opportunity to publicly thank Bob Ritchie and also Bernie Kubiak, who not only served us for this year, but for a about nine or ten months prior to that. And then in addition to that, the three counselors who worked on this, and they are Pat, Evan, and Alyssa. But really shout out to this guy because he did an incredible amount of work the whole time that the committee was operating. <laughs> <laughs> And to Jeff for being an enormous clerk of the works. Yes. Can I add uh, Ken Hargraves, who was on the original bylaw right. review Thank committee, you. and Kay Moran, who was also and on the And Kay Moran committee. is also, yes. Thank she you. left town. She couldn't stand <laughs> it anymore. And now Jeff is leaving town. <laughs> She's enjoying Portland, though. No, just working elsewhere, not leaving That's town. True. Okay, so now, in keeping with the confidence that other counselors have placed in us. Let's quickly move through the rest of these and let me know if there are amendments because you want to put dates certain on or maybe you want to split a motion, okay? So the first one is to add condominium and cooperative conversion, a general bylaw recommended for deletion to the document bylaws identified for future consideration, last edited 12-05-19. And proposed general bylaw 3.34, regulation of signs to the document 
bylaw identification for future consideration last edited 12 05 19, and to refer the document to the Town Council Governance, Organization, and Legislation Committee to report a recommended timeline for development, developing a work plan to the Town Council on March 9th, 2020. Is there a motion? Is there a second? Second. Is there a discussion? Um, yes, George. GOL meets twice before that, so I guess we can meet this uh, request. Um, could somebody just enlighten me as to why, and I'm sure there's a very good and simple reason why there is a date certain this March 9th? Alyssa. Since I wrote that, yes, I can tell you, because it, we, don't, we want people to know that we are going to be developing a plan of what to work on. So March 9th, your plan could be, aside from if there's a separate conversation about the condominium part, but in regards to the signed bylaw and the other items that, were all, that already are on that list, the idea was we knew you couldn't do it, and this was when we thought we might do it at the last meeting. We knew you probably couldn't get it done in February, and the way that 30 days and 45 days and the usual periods that we tried to you know, compare, use our usual precedents, and it came out to March for the next meeting, and that idea being then that that's the plan at that point. That's not, you have them all written, although some people might have specific ones they want written by then, but there, that's the plan of, okay, that means sign, we're gonna do this per in time period, we're gonna do the others in this time period. It's, as we've done with many other town council reports, it's your report out on your plan, not that you've necessarily accomplished everything, unless you get a motion tonight that tells you a thing has to be done by then. Okay. Any further questions on this? Darcy. So this list of um, uh, bylaws identified for future consideration is different from other bylaws that we're going to be considering. Yes, these were the ones that were forwarded by the committee. Mm -hmm. It was in our original packet when we first started looking at this. But we've added to it. We've added the additional ones that we are referring directly. But this was a list provided that recommended that we refer these to GOL. Okay, and they're going to be treated separately from other things that are being Right, because the other directly. things were added as yeah. a separate item. I'm sorry, Evan. So I just, I think Alyssa clarified it, but I want to just make sure I know what I'm voting on. So it says to report a recommended timeline for developing a work plan for the council. So you kept saying you're reporting your plan on March 9th, but this sounds like it's reporting a timeline to develop a plan. So we would say, we'll, so the report could literally be on March 9th. Our timeline is to have a plan to you by June 6th, and that would comply because it's a timeline for developing a work plan. I'm, what, what, what's the product that we're looking for from this? Alyssa. From my standpoint, it was maximum flexibility because I thought there might be ones that the council said, but we really need you to work on this one first. And we would give that direction to GOL, and therefore they would come up with, we're going to work on sign, we're going to work on condos and February and March, but we're not going to be able to start looking at the sign bylaw until sometime in June, so our timeline for that looks about like this. So it both uh, tried to address specific ones and then didn't lose sight of any of them, but some of them are probably going to get pushed kind of far out. Thank you. Any further questions? Okay, then I'm going to call the question. The motion is up there, and in this case, it specifically deals with the bylaws identified for future consideration late, last edited 12-0519. Are there any other questions? If not, call the question. All those in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain. 13 -0 -0.
Okay, now we're going to move on to the ones that are specific to ones that individual counselors have added during our discussion. The first one is to refer section, in fact, Kathy, I'm just gonna ask you to read it. I'll read it and maybe I, I'll add a word or two of explanation. It's, so section 3.4 is the responsible employer for public construction projects. That's what it is in the current bylaw. And so this is referring it to GOL to make a recommendation whether the wording that has been deleted from the existing bylaw in three instances should be added back to avoid the risk of weakening the bylaw. Specifically, should the following be added back? The requirement that bidders, quote, agree in writing that they shall comply to the reference labor laws. Number two, the requirement that contractors slash subcontractors shall, quote, certify under oath and in writing on a weekly basis that they are in compliance with such obligations, end quote. And the third is a penalty of liquidated damages payable to the town amount of 5% of the dollar value of the contract, end quote. That was one of the possible actions if someone was out of compliance. Um, the reason I... Uh, uh, let's start with the motion, please. Okay. okay, so the motion's on the floor and it's been seconded. Now, Kathy, speak to the motion. Okay, the, um, when I went back and compared the revision to the existing, these were words that were taken out that I think could potentially weaken it because there are a couple different points where the contractors had to attest in writing that they were going to comply and it gave you leverage to see and, and we have one additional penalty. So I asked a couple people um, whether there'd been any discussion on did this weaken our ability to control or hold people accountable? Was there a discussion? And uh, this came from legal counsel. This didn't come directly out of the committee. So my hope is that GOL would look closely at this because these words are not in the Massachusetts general law, the ones I've referenced. Most of the others, it was simplified to say, take a look at the law and this is what they're supposed to do. So okay. these are wording that I'm seeing many towns put in their responsible employer, this do it in writing so that you know that they've, they've acknowledged that they have these obligations. Okay. So I'd like the consideration of, at least for the time being, if that should be put back in in the whatever places they best fit. And I don't know about the penalty, but it, we, had, we had four possible penalties under the current bylaw, and we're down to three for not being in compliance. So there wasn't any rationale given on why delete the fourth. If there's a good one, fine. Mm -hmm. But that's why I think this should be referred. Okay. Are there any questions at this time? We're, remember, we're not getting into a debate about this. It's merely a referral. Evan. So I guess I'm curious, uh, as a member of GOL and a now former member of the Bylaw Review Committee, um, what the expectation of GOL is for this. And the reason I ask that is because, uh, so the, in, if my memory is correct, and I am going to ask Alyssa or Pat or Jeff to correct me if my memory is incorrect, um, was that the revision to the Responsible Employer for Public Construction Project Bylaw came from our town attorney. We sent them and they sent back fairly detailed edits. Um, and that's how we have what we have here. If it went to GOL, I don't think that, I, I don't believe that anyone on GOL has the personal content knowledge to be able to evaluate this statement. And so to me, GOL would just say, oh, well, we don't really know. We have to get town attorney opinion, but this came from town attorney. And so I'm curious what the expectation that GOL will do is given that we probably don't have the ability to really assess these questions without legal counsel, who is the one who recommended these changes. Jeff, do you have to, anything to say to this particular issue? I would just agree with Evan that, that these recommendations came from the town attorney um, and with detailed uh, revisions to this and, and several other bylaws. Um, and uh, so, Yes, I, I think that you know the bylaw review committee was under the auspices of the of the town attorney, so we felt that that was important to incorporate okay. into the recommendation. So what I'm hearing from Kathy, just let me clarify this, is that in comparing our bylaw to other towns, she feels that these pieces 
have been taken out of our bylaw but exist in other towns and do not appear in Mass General Law. And I think, Kathy, what you're looking for is why would we eliminate these or should we not? Yeah. And it may, re it may require GOL to go back and have an additional conversation and come back with, with town attorney and understand why they would have taken them out. Right, and my recollection was the general answer was that the state law was sufficient to cover the town um, in case there was issues with the public contract. Um, but I, I think that if the council feels that they need more of an explanation or um, whether or not adding this back in would present any legal problems, and that's you know more of a policy consideration versus a legal consideration, I think that that's um, a legitimate question. Yeah. Uh, Pat. Yes, as a member of the bylaw review committee and also um, a counselor working on wage theft bylaw, um, I initially accepted that explanation that we didn't need it. But after consultation with Lisa Clausen from the Carpenters Union and Rose Bookbinder from Pioneer Valley Workers Center and reviewing uh, bylaws from Somerville, Cambridge, uh, Brook Brookline, uh, several several towns, this language was there. And what um, Lisa Clausen said is we need it there because it gives strength um, to, even if it is listed in the Mass General Law. Yeah. And I've come to the agreement with that position and I would like to see this come back. Okay, so we're, again, we're not gonna get into the debate. I think what the petitioner in this case, who's Kathy, is asking for is greater understanding or perhaps the Rest restoration of these if they feel it's strengthened. And those kinds of debates exact are exactly what will happen in GOL. Is there any further discussion? Okay. All those in favor of the motion? Yes. Raise your hand and say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? 13 zero, zero. Moving on to the next one. Uh, Darcy, why don't you read this one? <laughs> Uh, to refer section 3.28 of the general bylaw, the single use plastic bag prohibition, and the document titled Single Use Plastic Bag Bylaw D3, et cetera, to the Governance Organization and Legislation Committee to make a recommendation on changes to the bylaw with a report back to the Town Council on blank date. No problem with that. <laughs> 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 uh, Let's put March 9th in there. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion? Yes, Darcy. Uh, I just wanted to mention that I that the um, document titled "Single Use Plastic Bag Bylaw D3." Is an amended version of the of the uh, of the bylaw. It's different from the one that was in the uh, packet in the last meeting. And uh, I actually, in response to what Jeff had said about uh, some of the language being out of date, I took that out. And and um, now the purpose is just one sentence and. That one sentence is sort of the crux of why I'm asking to keep the defi definitions in, um, because the purpose really underlines that the primary purpose of the bylaw is to reduce the negative effects of single-use plastic bags on the environment, reduce contamination of plastic bags in residential recycling streams, and most importantly, to encourage consumers to bring reusable bags while shopping eliminating the environmental impacts of any okay. single-use bags. So that really puts that one sentence in the purpose and gives a different context to the definition. Okay. This is being referred with all of those documents to GOL, okay? By having it in here, it's referred, okay? Is there any further discussion? All those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Thirteen zero zero. Okay, the next one, uh, Mandy Joe. 
to refer to the Governance Organization and Legislation Committee Section 3.24 Unlawful Noise of the General Bylaws to make a recommendation on whether to remove lawnmowers, leaf blowers, snow blowers, and other similar mechanical devices to the items included as, quote, loud, disturbing, injurious, or unnecessary noise, end quote, with a report back to the Town Council on March 9th, 2020. Is Second. There a second. Okay, there's a motion's been made and a second. Is there further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain. Okay, thank you. Now, Jeff, thanks for all your great work. We know you're only, I'm sorry, do we have one more? Which one is one? Oh, wait a minute. It's not on our sheet. Okay. So, Jeff, we know you're only going a to town away, and we know you're going to still live in Amherst, or at least we think you are. Yes. <laughs> for now. Thank you for all your work with the town over the last four years. Thank you. Um, we wish you well in your future um, growth opportunity, because it certainly is that one. And... Um, we look forward to hearing about your success. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure and an honor to work with you. Thank you. That was against our bylaws, but that's okay. I mean, our rules are procedure, but it's okay. If we want to break them, we will. The audience can't, but we can clap. All right. Uh, Mr. Slaughter, Dr. Slaughter, Assistant Coach Slaughter, <laughs> Finance Director Slaughter. <laughs> Good evening. Hi. So now we're going back to um, 6A and ask Doug specifically if there are any highlights he would make, like to make first yeah, I, I realized. Um, so. Yeah, we, we're, because I shuffled the agenda so that we could put you, I had actually put C, 7C before you. Oh, do you need to do 7C first? Well, there's another person in the audience waiting, and he's been here since the beginning. Do you oh, mind? I can, I'm I can sorry. Step away. That's all right. Thank you. Happy. Okay, we're going to do. 7C, and let me just frame 7C as, oh boy. Um, the issue of Lincoln Avenue has been before the council in the past, in fact, five years ago, at which point there were numerous doc documents produced by uh, the town and uh, by the council, I mean, by the select board at the time. And uh, there were um, various recommended changes made at that time. However, it's five years later, and the residents of the Lincoln Avenue have come forward again. I think it's a different group, probably. And they have placed a petition before the town uh, that deals with further changes regarding parking and the public way. And the only thing tonight is to, um, this was originally on an agenda as if we were going to go ahead with a hearing and there was some objection to that. And so before I schedule a hearing, um, I was looking to the council regarding that issue. Um, and so there is a motion which is to schedule a public hearing regarding changes to the public way on Lincoln Avenue on a date to be determined by the council president. Um, and I just, before we go on to discuss it, is there a second? Okay. Now, discussion. Alyssa. So as I said at the previous meeting, the problem here is that what one does is one puts in a public hearing notice for a particular plan. One does not put in a public hearing notice for do something different on Lincoln. 
So once we decide what the plan is that we put up for a public hearing, then we publish the notice for the public hearing and then we have the public hearing. Normally that works in, as you saw, with the materials provided from 15 is that staff, and as staff has indicated in this case, staff has been working on putting together different parts of the puzzle and would be presenting something to us and we would then, unlike the time in 2015, we would decide if that was what we were putting or if we wanted to add something to it or mm -hmm. if we maybe make the area larger, maybe make the area smaller. Um, in giving ourselves flexibility, obviously, because it's always a pain to schedule public hearings, but we don't know what we're scheduling the public okay. hearing for yet. Okay. So Mr. Balkman, is the staff prepared to come forward with a plan, a recommended plan? Yes. Okay. And that's what I'm trying to get across. Once we see that plan, that's when we decide if we're going to have a public hearing at all. Okay. Evan. So I want to second that, and I plan to vote against this motion. Um, and the reason for that is when I opened up my packet to see what we were authorizing a public hearing about, um, I found some old plans from 2015. I found a letter uh, written to the council with no attribution, no date. I don't know who it came from. Um, it quoted, or it didn't quote, but it cited staff opinion in the letter, but I didn't have anything from staff. And I can't possibly imagine voting okay. to authorize a public hearing unless I have in front of me a proposal of what that is that's updated with maps and input from staff so that I know whether or not I feel like this is something we should move forward on. But to schedule a public hearing on a, a, a plan that apparently exists that we haven't seen, okay. uh, I'm not gonna vote for that. Okay. So the idea would be that at our next meeting we would receive the plan so, if I may, so the genesis of this is came from the neighbors. Neighbors mm -hmm. came and said, we would like to make a change. And they've talked with the staff. And if you recall, back in December, we presented the idea to the council. And the council didn't have a process in place and said, we should think this through. And that's where we are today. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the proposal is from the neighbors. And, you know, the staff would have its own recommendation on this. So it depends which one you want to have advertised, the one that the neighbors asked uh, the council to consider or the one that, you, that the staff is going to be recommending. Evan. So perhaps it would be useful to get a presentation of both and then the council could have a discussion about which one we want to move forward with and authorize a public hearing for. Mandy Jo. So I, I was going to say something similar, but um, mine went to a committee you know we got some notice today that there are public hearings for public ways coming because staff has a plan and the president has said yes we're going to put that on as a public hearing as required on the agenda because the president has the agenda setting authority and so I think where we've gotten stuck is when the proposal comes from the residents who says it's ready for the public hearing the council as a whole or the president and I, I think I tend to just still go towards the president does but when you've got competing potential potentially competing plans and it sounds like there may be or at least staff may have a recommendation different from what the residents desire I, I don't know though because I haven't seen it um, my thoughts are maybe that needs to head to a committee for a recommendation from a committee on if a public hearing is held this is what the committee recommends the plan the hearing be held on or something. I, again, I don't know, but. Yeah, and th this is, well, it may not be new to people who were on the select board, it's new to the council. Uh, Paul. So you could treat this like a town meeting warrant article where there's a request to change the parking on Lincoln Ave that would include something like this and you make it broad enough in your public hearing notice that it could encompass a dis any decision that the council would wanna make and you could narrow that down or do whatever you want with it. So that's one way to meet the public hearing notice requirement um, in, in terms of moving forward. Steve. I guess I see this more like, or more like a public planning board public hearing where the only people that can request a public hearing and basically the 
are the major parties, are the owners of the land. So the town is the owner of the land. It should be the town's proposal that we're considering. And at a public hearing for planning board, abutters and others can present alternate plans, but they, it's not the alternate plans that we should be considering. It should be the owner of the land's proposals that we're considering. So to me, this is analogous to me proposing a project for my neighbor's land and asking for there to be a public hearing on that. Okay. Additional comment. George. I guess I'm still struggling with this. Um, we have a proposal, it seems, from the town, and um, we want to see that before we decide whether we want a public hearing on that proposal. Is that correct? I think I mean, the idea was that we would see both the, what the town is recommending and also what the neighbors are asking before we decide whether we want to set a date for a public hearing. That is that correct? That is one of, the, one of the options on the table. And I'm having trouble with that because it seems that that is the whole purpose of a public hearing, is to have these plans presented for us to consider. And I agree that we need to see these before the, the public hearing, but to wait until we have all these materials to decide whether we want to have a public hearing or not, right. I have trouble understanding that. Um, according to the bylaw, public hearing is required for these sorts of requests. So um, eventually there has to be a public hearing of some kind. And my understanding was that um, if you've got a proposal that's ready to be presented, um, it's presented at the public hearing. And then we listen and then we decide we can do anything we want with it. We could just ignore it. We could send it to a committee. We could, we could you know, fix it on the spot or we could accept it as it is or whatever. But it seems the first and most important step is to actually have the public hearing to have uh, the town and perhaps the, the residents uh, make their case. And then we decide what we want to do next. But now it sounds like we're going to wait until all these materials are assembled and sent to us. And then we'll meet again in two weeks and decide whether we want to hold a public hearing or not. I don't get it. The other option is the one that Paul proposed, which is you basically have a broader public hearing and all parties. That's present their proposals. Yeah. Alyssa. If you go too broad, then people don't know why they should show up. They don't know what the specifics are. Are you going to say Lincoln from any possible change to any type of parking restriction running from route, not from College Street all the way to UMass, and therefore everyone in town should literally come to the hearing? Because that may very well feel like that affects them based on their commute. That's why you normally have something a bit more specific than that. In terms of why you do this, I didn't make us wait since December, George. I'm sitting here waiting. I don't know why we didn't get this specific proposal long before now. But now's when, now's we're hearing still that it's available to us, but we haven't had it presented to us yet. The reason why is if you look back at the minutes from 2015 of what happened at Select Board, you will find that we found staff's plan which they put together to be insufficient. And we would not have called that hearing had they given us that plan ahead of time before we had a chance to actually schedule the hearing. This is based purely on experience. The plan, you're, I believe you're indicating that because staff came up with the plan, it must be a viable plan. The select board did not believe that it was a viable plan. Therefore, we had no need to call that public hearing we would have asked for a different public hearing based on the information we had. So rather than getting to the hearing for the first time, seeing the plan at the hearing and saying, man, I don't know why we're doing this. This isn't the plan I was, was thinking we were going to be doing. I want us to say, yep, that's absolutely the plan we want to look at. This is the area. We'll make it kind of broad and kind of specific at the same time. And this is when it'll be. Darcy. Dorothy. Well, I think I would like to us to see the town plan before we have a public hearing. I would like us to have a public hearing in which the town plan and the plan from the residents are, are presented and we can discuss it. Um, I'd also like to say that the plan that we're saying, the plan of the residents, it really is beyond that. It's really people who use, people who live on Lincoln Avenue and people who drive on Lincoln Avenue. And I do believe that the plan that um, has been put together by uh, the people who live on Lincoln Avenue 
has very distinct li limits. It would be from Amity Street to um, uh, Fearing. No, block beyond Fearing. What, what's, yeah. Mass Ave. But it's, but it's all, it is, it is written out. Um, the, there are many people who've been waiting a long time for this. I, I'm very pleased and interested to hear what Alyssa is saying because it's useful, it's really useful to hear that we have to really know what we're doing when we go into it and not to be surprised. Um, also that everybody should have a chance to see that plan first. But I'd like to do it, proceed in a quick manner. So I leave that to you, Lynn, to find out how we can okay. get the materials and have a hearing quickly. Sarah. So I think to make it easier, if you're gonna say we're having a hearing about, if you put, if we're voting on a motion that says we're, hearing, we're having a hearing about changes to Lincoln Ave, like when I'm reading all this information tonight, I was like, what, what are the exact changes? How are we as a legislative body supposed right. to walk into a meeting Absolutely. that's been advertised as changes to Lincoln Avenue, not coming from anybody because town council hasn't talked about it. I haven't seen the residence proposal and I, Wow, I'm really shocked sitting here to find out, and I'm not placing blame, I'm just saying like as we work on process, it then it kind of shocked me to say, oh, well the town has a plan. I didn't even know it. I think probably a lot of us didn't and we hadn't seen it. So I'm not pointing any fingers, but I, I just think that as we're doing things, a certain process is important. You can't hold a hearing on, we're gonna sit down about Lincoln Ave and not know what it is. And how can the legislative body that's supposed to make some kind of decision walk into a meeting without having the town's proposal and we get it at the same time as everyone else. I, I'm, and I'm not, I'm not trying, I'm not being blaming, I'm just trying to, I think the, that maybe, I know George is just looking, to people who are immersed in this, right? I think you're like, what, what are you talking about? Because we all know, but some of us don't because we haven't been given it. That's, that's all I'm saying, and it's no blame or anything. I'm just saying I think we need that information, and how can you hold a hearing without saying what it's about? Okay. Andy. So uh, there's one other aspect of it, and that is that we had, the, where does the Transportation Advisory Committee fit into this? And because we did get a memo from TAC, and um, when, we have a planning board hearing, and suppose that the planning board comes to us with a revision on accessory dwellings. I'll just pull them out of the air. Um, by the time it gets to a hearing, the planning board has said to us through their report and recommendation, this is the change that I would like to make on accessory dwellings. And then a hearing is held about the very specific proposals. And if there are people who have an interest in it, neighbors or other residents, uh, people who would be affected by it in some manner, they come in and are able to react to the specific proposal. And um, that makes for a logical hearing to take place. So I guess that what I would like to see is um, a proposal that has some vetting with um, possibly TAC. I believe that process needing to be fleshed out because it also could go back to a council committee. And then um, when we have a specific proposal, we bring that proposal to the council, say to the council, do you want to have a hearing on it? Since this isn't the planning board, but now this is the council that would be having the hearing. Let us make the decision and then we notice um, the public at large in a very broad sense what it is that is being proposed and if uh, people who live or drive on Lincoln Avenue um, find it adequate, they will tell us, and if they find it inadequate and would like something else, they will tell us that too, um, and that will give us a chance to have a meaningful hearing in which we can take the information gathered and use it. Are there other comments? Dorothy. Sarah, what you're seeing is, is continued growing pains. 
This has come before CRC. Um, the people from Lincoln Avenue have come and spoken at a council meeting. Uh, they have met small group designated um, people, have met with the president and with the town manager, but, and they've gone to TAC, all right? The problem is that we didn't seem to know what was the procedure, okay? So that's what we're talking about right now. So we may, we may create and come up with a procedure because we haven't had one. But this has been, people have been working on this, meeting with the police chief, meeting with different uh, department heads for a long time. But you're right, we can't go, we should not go into a hearing not knowing exactly what that plan from the residents is and without knowing the plan that he said the town has, which I haven't seen. Kathy. Okay, I'm, 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 I'm going to be in agreement that we don't have a plan in front of us, but we did on 1216, and we have it in our attachments. It's not proposed in the format of a plan, but they, the residents came to us with a specific proposal. So I, what I'm not sure of what, in what has just been described, we've been sending them around to various places, and I don't understand why one of those committees, including our CR, just didn't take hold and say, okay, here's the kernel of an idea. They wanted no parking on either side between 8 and 5 p.m. That was the proposal, very specific. Um, why didn't we say, here's a piece of one, what's the town saying, and come to us with an amalgam that said, here are three ways of addressing the Lincoln. It, it seems to me it's similar to, not completely like when we were kicking percent for art around, Everyone saying the bylaw is not quite right, and it went to finance, and it went to CRC. But we had to put a small group together, just a few people. So maybe we could do that here, just come up with what, what are the options with a little bit of discussion on it so we don't keep moving the ball to another court. That's, thank you. Darcy. I just have a question. Um, in the, the December 16th, letter from the group. Um, they said that almost every house has signed a petition supporting this request. Did we see the petition and was it sort of in the form of free petition under the charter? Um, it was not in the form under a petition under the charter. It was a written statement with signatures. And yes, you did. So we're, we're just treating it as um, that at our own discretion, we can provide a public hearing on this issue. I'm sorry? I don't think we ever saw the letter. Oh, okay. We it existed, but we didn't see it officially as a council. All right. I thought you did. No. Okay. In other words, you saw the letter, but you didn't see the petition. Okay. At the 12th, the, the, it was letter. added again in our current packet at 7C as an item. So that document was that we saw in the middle of December, you know, the last meeting was re added here. I mean, that's the last time we saw uh, what they were proposing to have done. Okay. Sarah. So. All I'm trying to say is usually when we have a hearing, it will even just describe a document. So you could have said, you know, we could have said changes to Lincoln Ave per document, yada, yada, yada. We didn't even, I don't believe, and maybe it's just me, but I have never been sent as a counselor a one page of proposed changes, yada, 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 which you, I, Maybe it's just me because everybody else is looking at me sort of blankly, but when I read the information that we had tonight, when I read information that had been given to me, I didn't feel like I actually knew exactly what we were, there was no package, there was no one document that gave us information about this, and that's, that's, all, I'm, that's all I'm saying. Okay, so, Mandy yes, Mandy Jo. I was just gonna suggest, it sounds like we're stuck, and to me, there's two options. We either agree to hold a hearing on that kernel of an idea without having talked about 
whether this council even likes that idea or not, or we send that kernel of an idea off to a committee to discuss, determine whether that's the right idea to have a hearing on or whether a modified idea would be more appropriate to have a hearing on, and then bring that recommendation back to this council as the recommendation for what to hold a hearing on. And in the consideration of that, it has gone to CRC, it's gone to no, TAC. No. It goes to GOM. It's, it's, it's well, no. It's, oh, I thought no, somebody said it had gone no, to CRC. No, no, no. Parking issues have come Other up. parking issues. Uh, this particular matter has never been at CRC. I, right. I'm sorry. sorry. Thank you. I was taking no, the counselor at their word. All right, then. Um, I think we should refer the whole thing to CRC. And they can sort out a tack. I mean, I, I personally would just as soon go ahead with the hearing. I'm going to just say that. But I'm hearing other people not feeling prepared for that. So if that's the case, then let's send it to a committee, and they'll get all the preparation that needs to be done. With, with the town plan? With the town plan. The, the neighbor's plan and other. The other option is we have a hearing and it's on the town plan. We look at the town plan. Next time we have the hearing with 14 days notice. Why can't we have, why can't we have the hearing with the town plan and the neighbor plan? The, the neighbor would present their plan as, as they, part, of part of that. Part of I'm it. sorry, yeah. I misunderstood. But, you. You but what somebody's saying is, somebody's been very clear, you have to have a plan to start with. Yes. And that's what you start with. And, the, and we either start with the neighbor's plan, which is not presented as a full plan, or the town plan. And the, then the neighbor's comment. And then we may also not finish the hearing that night. We may refer it or ask for more information or whatever. I mean, if you look at the record of the last time, that's exactly what happened. All right. Alyssa? And there were many upset neighbors way, the way the whole process worked. So in terms of the various levels of preparation of the people who were making decisions and how many times they needed to come back and the way the whole process worked. I guess I don't see a problem with referring it to CRC with the understanding that what we're getting back as a council prior to the Friday before our Monday council meeting is an extensive report that says, here's what TAC thought, or if they're not ready to be part of it. Here's right. what their neighbors proposed. Here's what staff says is the way to go, given the context of what we did there five years ago and what they want done now. We understand what they're saying, but this is what we think is the thing to do. And then CRC comes to tell us, yes, this is what we think is the right thing. And Towns and Council has had a chance to read it before we get here and says, yep, that sounds like it covers all the bases of what people wanted. We would never have a hearing, almost never, never say never, on a hearing on a plan that was just a petition that somebody gave us that didn't meet the concept of free petition. We want staff to tell us what is the thing to do to address these folks' problem. Okay because they have a lot more context than the neighbors could ever have, whether they've met with them two or three times or not. We have, everybody, public safety, public works, has significant opinions on how things should work there and how they can maybe come to a compromise. George. And my understanding is staff is ready to do that. And my understanding is the neighbors are ready to do it. So again, I still do not understand. It sounds like we're having a hearing before the hearing. We have a hearing in order to decide whether we should have a hearing. Um, th we have proposals in front of us, and I don't see, I agree with you, Lynn, we should go ahead and have the public hearing. I think the problem is that the whole council does not have. They will have. Those I mean, documents. I never imagined that there would be a public hearing in which the council did not have the relevant materials before the hearing. Right. It was assumed that you would have these in, your, in some packet form well before, I don't know, two days, three days, you tell me. But um, we have council meetings and we get our packet, what, three days before? Um, how many days do you want in advance? But it was assumed that you obviously would have to have these materials before you have the hearing. But the idea that we're going to decide beforehand with all the materials whether we even want to have a hearing 
It sounds like we're having a hearing about having a hearing. Um, we're ready to have a hearing. The materials will be in your possession before the hearing. And we have the hearing in which both the town and the neighbors will make their presentation. And then you all have to make up your minds. Um, but it sounds like you want to make up your minds ahead of time about the issue before you have the hearing to hear what people want to propose. And I just don't understand that. So help me understand this. Andy. Um, I have a um, great degree of respect for um, many of the people who I know personally who live on Lincoln Avenue. And I know that they are struggling with something and have thought about it a lot. But I also recognize from the experience that this town has had before, and I'm going to give an example, that well-meaning people are not traffic engineers and don't have the experience of traffic engineers. And the example that I will give is town meeting voting on the floor to, ref to say, hey, we don't think that there should be a traffic circle at the north end of downtown, and we vote to refer this to the select board to um, have a uh, make a decision regarding whether we can look at um, a traffic light resolution to the problem. In fact, um, uh, it had been considered before and um, was explained why it was not feasible, but in any event, um, the reality was that the majority of town meeting reacted on something that was done because of an emotional response to a change without really understanding a very complex set of problems that um, go with what it takes to manage traffic appropriately and what is the best resolution to do that. And um, so what I'm hoping is to um, take the um, information, which, and it should have been done a long time ago. I think that's the real problem is, is that we got behind on the scheduling uh, of, of getting to this, but the, the proper step is to have a process that allows us to look at a proposal from um, our staff who have that professional expertise, let them bring it forward. If the neighbors then, um, once they see it, or others who are interested are happy with it, they will tell us. And if they're unhappy with it, they will tell us too. But if forms a public hearing around something specific. Shalini, you wanted to speak? Yeah, I think I, I just wanted to hear from the staff um, before we have the public hearing um, to get a sense of uh, what, what they think is the solution. And then I also wanted to understand from people who are getting affected, which is obviously the neighbors, so we already know what the neighbors want, and if there's anybody else who's being affected, maybe get a sense. But mainly I wanted to hear from the staff, what do, what do they see? I mean, and who, who in the staff would be the person to tell us how this affects the traffic flow or safety and other aspects? Paul. So according to the council's policy, you asked for the town engineer, the fire chief, and the police chief, and the town manager. Right. So the two, here are the options I am hearing, okay? One is um, we have the staff appear before us with their document at our next meeting and decide whether we're going to hold a public hearing. And at that point, we can also have all of the material from the uh, petitioners as well and anything that TAC has said. That's one option. Another option is we refer it to CRC and they come back with a recommendation as to whether or not we have a hearing. Those are the two. Yeah, Evan. Well, there's also currently a motion on the table that's neither of those two options. And we can so withdraw that. Okay. You were the motion can, maker, right? Can, you were the motion maker? Can I just ask on option one um, to Paul, by February 10th, which is the next meeting, could we get a document where the staff came together and said, this is what we think 
can or should be done? Yes, we will be prepared to do that. But and if I may comment, the question is, did you want us to take that to TAC first or to just present it to the council first? Well, that's, it was, I mean, Steve wants to say something too. So Steve, go ahead. I don't want to take your time. Yeah, I don't know the answer, but um, I do think taking no preparation for reading it three days in advance is risky business. So we don't allow that with bylaws changes, right? So there have to be two readings of bylaw changes. Mm -hmm. So going straight to a hearing where who knows what That's we'll decide. That's not what I was suggesting. No, I know, I know, but yeah. I'm just, yeah. So I think that the council should hear it. Yes, I think there should be, in this particular case, I think there should be a pre-hearing before the, a hearing, be, no, it's not, it's a information before the hearing. I mean, I think it okay. just is, is and, and uh, quite frankly, that happened on planning board for issues that were possibly contentious, okay. that there would be an information session with, in which interested parties could be invited, and then there would be a public hearing after that. Paul, my understanding is that this group has already met with TAC. They went to TAC and TAC, I was there when they came the first yes. time and TAC said, don't talk to us, talk to. You know, I'm so sorry, that, Kathy. Yeah. Paul, what, what did happen? So there, there was a resident there, it was on the TAC agenda and then it was sort of taken off the agenda because it wasn't clear if the council wanted advice from the, from the TAC at that moment in time. And so I think this is where we sort of pulled back and said, well, what is the process we want to follow for this right. type of thing? And I think that's what's being worked through with GOL or whoever is doing that. And then, but this one sort of was a, um, we want to get this one going through the process, so let's get it moving. Through a process that we really haven't defined, oh. which is the whole problem. Oh. Right, and I, so, um, with all due respect to TAC, okay, I'm going to suggest that at our next meeting, we see both the town's um, recommendation and the citizens' request, and that we make a decision whether or not to have a hearing. And the TAC can be there or not be there. Alyssa? I think we have a couple of issues here. One is there's, there's literally no reason why TAC can't meet to discuss this, and it makes no sense to me that if we are going to have it in their charge that they talk about any of this kind of stuff, that we're just going to ignore them in this case because it's not timely. So they should be getting this in. They should be required to have a meeting and make a decision. And, and then come to us with that. And in that. terms of the framing of the material that we get mm -hmm. at a meeting, it would need to be which is why I thought it was going to CRC. Um, but the material would be the town's proposal is that we have a hearing, the town council hold a hearing on XYZ. The reason for that is see attached from TAC, see attached from the residents. It's not a resident proposal and a town proposal. It's the town's reaction to the resident's proposal and the TAC proposal. It's not Tim Nelson thinks this, but so and so who lives on Lincoln thinks something else. It, it's not that. It's incorporating. Right. So we're back to the two options. And the second option is to refer to CRC and have them come forward with a recommendation. And in the process, TAC also reviews material. Mandy Jo. So I'm with George in trying to understand why this one for holding a public hearing is any different from the public hearing that has already been scheduled on the bid slash chamber request to permanently put in a handicap accessible ramp on the public way that we have seen absolutely no information for, but the hearing was scheduled. So why is this request so much different that we have to have so much information before we decide to hold the public hearing. What makes this one different than that or the Eversource petitions or another public hearing on some other permanent public way we held public hearing? You know, what makes this one so much different that we can't decide to hold the hearing without seeing massive amounts of information before deciding to hold the hearing. I get that we want to see it, 
when we go into the public hearing. But we should be able to say and trust our president to not schedule that public hearing until that information will be available. Steve. Because this has to do with the movement of people and goods on a really critical road in Amherst? So does the bid chamber request for a ramp on the main sidewalk in downtown. Alyssa. Because the president doesn't know when she has sufficient information to make a decision on this hearing. I'm not sure she knew on the ramp either for that matter, but we didn't get a choice to weigh in on that. We didn't know that was coming and we couldn't put a stick in the spoke, so to speak. On this, I know I have had experience with staff telling me something that was not sufficient for me to act on that night. Why am I wasting everyone's time and scheduling a hearing for something that is a waste of our time? If we see the information and we like it, this isn't about Lincoln. This is about process. I agree. We probably should have had a different conversation about the ramp. Verizon, I'm going to put it on a whole different level in Eversource. But when it comes to this, let's remember, people can come up with an idea to say, I want no parking on my street. I'm going to go to every single committee in town, and I'm going to say no parking on my street. And it's not going to be Lincoln. It's going to be some crazy cul-de-sac that none of you have even heard of. That doesn't mean they get to have a hearing, OK? That means staff's going to have to weigh in and say, oh, you know what? We could do this other thing to help these people out. And we might not even need a hearing, right? We are looking for staff to tell us this is what they want, this is what we think makes sense. And when we look at that, we're going to say, yes, you're right, or we're going to be like 2015 and say, that isn't what they said they wanted, that isn't what we think is right, and we're not going to, we're not going to make that decision. I'd like a motion. A motion. I'm withdrawing the motion. So Could you repeat the motion, please? No. The motion was to schedule a public hearing regarding changes to the public okay. way on Lincoln Avenue on a date to be determined by the council president. Okay. Dorothy. I make a motion that we have a meeting, a regular council meeting, at which we have the materials from the town and from the residents, and that the whole council has a chance to talk about this because uh, Lincoln Avenue is a major thoroughfare and it does affect many, many things in the town. And that after we have that discussion, You're that we just, call a hearing. Let me stop with the motion. Stop with the, just okay. repeat the motion. Repeat the motion, not why, but just the motion. I move that the town present its plan and that the residents present their plan at, and that we have this material ahead of time for our next meeting and we have a discussion and decide to have a public hearing. That's a pub I'm sorry. Is there what you describe as a public hearing. That is a public hearing. Is there a second to the motion? Okay. That, that okay. This, I'm, you know what? Um, let's just, I'm sorry. George? I know, we're back to a hearing for a hearing. Evan. Dorothy used the word present, the town presents, yeah. and the uh, residents present. If we can interpret the word present to literally just mean give us documents that show what those are, That's I would. I it, right, so you're not talking about a formal no, power, no, no. you're just saying, they, they will, the town and the residents, we will have their documents in front of us, and then we will decide based on those documents whether or not those proposals merit a public hearing. Mm -hmm. yeah. I support this. So the motion's been made and seconded. Any other comment? I just want to point out that there is a, propo a, a specific proposal in writing from the residents, so I'm not sure if we're asking them to resubmit it. We could just title it proposal. But we did get one. Yeah. It will, will, that's, oh. We want this, we want the petition to. It's it, all the material provided by the residents. Darcy. I, I think it's actually really important to hear from TAC, too. Um, from TAC, TAC. Yes, um, that they present 
or the, give us a report also. The real issue is going to be whether TAC would be able to meet before then. But George? Imagine that the manager, because town staff has brought it to him, brings us a public ways request that requires our action. It's not from neighbors. It's something that's come from someone in, you know, say DPW, whatever, and he presents it to us. So what you're suggesting is then we're going to have what? A, uh, we're going to have a discussion about that, decide whether we want to have a public hearing about it or not. It seems to me that, that he has and can perfectly bring proposals to us that require us to make a decision that um, we would then set a public hearing for and we would hear that we'd have the proposal and we'd discuss it. I don't understand the difference. It seems the only difference here is this is coming from a group of neighbors and for some reason that's requiring all these extra hoops that they have to go through just to get a public hearing. Um, they have a proposal. It's been brought to town. Staff has looked at it. They've made their proposal. They are not the same. Um, there are going to be some differences and a public hearing seems to me to be exactly the right circumstance for which this is designed to, to be presented and for us to then make our minds up. And we could very well decide then to refer it to a committee. We could decide to send it back to staff. We could do any number of things. But this idea of doing all this stuff in advance of just deciding to have a public hearing, I mean, the bylaw makes it explicit that these kinds of parking changes require a public hearing. So if there is a, a request for a change for, for parking in a particular area, we can't say, well, we're not going to have a public hearing about it. You, you seem to want to have to decide ahead of time the merits of the case before you've heard the case. So the town has a case to make, the neighbors have a case to make. Why don't we simply have a public hearing, let them make their case, and then we will decide what we want to do, which could be anything. I have no idea what we'll decide. But it seems we want to decide beforehand. And so that's my problem. Listen. It's clear we don't share the same definition of public hearing. You're seeing public hearing as they present their case. That's not how it works. A public hearing is a specific plan that anybody can then weigh in on. It is not competing plans. It is not presenting competing plans. It is a plan. It is the plan from staff that is written in this case in response to a neighbor's request. A neighbor can ask anytime, anytime to do a change in parking and we are never required to have a hearing unless they follow rules for something like free petition. We are not required just because they came up with it as an idea. If you mention the idea of staff just coming up with it on their own, with absolutely no input. I mean, yeah, obviously they've heard something, but it's not because neighbors have written a petition. It's not because neighbors have felt like they've been trotted through a billion different committees. Staff just comes up with something cool. I still believe the town council gets to decide whether or not that thing's cool enough to warrant a hearing or not. We do not just automatically defer because our staff wrote it. That's why we control the public hearing aspect of our rules. Evan. Right, I think that's the thing. We're not having a public hearing to decide our position on it. We're having a public hearing to decide whether it's something, uh, we're having a meeting to decide whether or not it's even something we want to pursue. I mean, you just gave the example, of what if the town manager had a proposal? Does he have to bring it here before we decide whether we want to have a public hearing? Yeah, because you know, if the town manager decided he wanted to put a 60 foot tall statue of Paul Bockelman in the middle of the, the common, I'm not just going to say, Which one? I'm not just, the North Common as part of the renovation. It's going to make <laughs> the price tax closed. much more expensive. If he decides that, I'm not just going to say, well, I guess we're going to have a public hearing okay. on that. I want All to right. know that it's All worthwhile. There's a motion on the floor. The motion on the floor is that at the next town council meeting, the plans, uh, that the proposal from the residents and the recommendation from the staff will be made available and we will discuss whether or not we're proceeding with a public hearing. That's the motion, right? Is that the motion? Did we include TAC? Could we have a friendly amendment to include TAC? Please. All right. And I will just say that that may delay whether it gets on this next agenda, but okay. All right. Okay. And anything that and it's a report from TAC. A report from TAC? At this point, TAC evidently did not hear it. It evidently was on the agenda, then went off the agenda. 
So TAC is not weighed in. But we do have that memo from Aaron Hayden about how they want. I'm sorry, please, one of you at a time speak. Yes. Me? Darcy. Um, we have a memo in the packet from Aaron Hayden about his tax willingness and interest in being involved in setting this right. uh, policy. So in order for them, however, to write a memo that includes any kind of recommendation, then they have to go through a process where they meet with the residents and possibly the town and the town. So in other words, we have to wait till we get a memo from TAC. In order to get that memo, TAC has to have a meeting. Well, so maybe we need to just include them in our process. Uh, we're not, they, they, they act as a separate body. Right, but if we're having, if we're having a meeting where the staff and the neighbors and everyone is going to be uh, if TAC, discussing the issues, obviously we would like TAC here. But before TAC could present any comment to us, they would need to meet here and form a, an opinion or a recommendation or just decide we don't want to say anything. But they'd have to meet. They're not just going to show up and speak individually. They have to speak as a body. Just the way the residents have spoken, quote, as a body and our town has spoken as a body. So all I'm saying is we, we can include TAC, but then I will not promise that this will be on the agenda two weeks from now because TAC may not have had time to meet, to form a feedback and give it to us. That's all. But the friendly amendment is TAC. Is there a second to the friendly amendment? Okay, fine. So can we say that the friendly amendment, assuming it's considered friendly, is that we make it clear to TAC that we are going to have a document in our packet for the February 10th. This is only January 27th. TAC doesn't live in Beijing, okay? It's, this is not hard. They, tomorrow, they, just, they doodle poll themselves and figure out when they can meet between now and ideally and, and our are you packet deadline, but that you inform them that we want to include them, but this is our timeline. Okay. Dorsey. I have not been to TAC, but I have heard that some residents spoke of the issue to TAC. However, I have not heard that TAC has seen a plan from the town, which I have not seen either. So if you are you suggesting that instead of having two proposals, which we were going to discuss, that we have TAC just coming and present the residence proposal? No. Because TAC, TAC has not been brought no. in on the town the, proposal. The only way the TAC is going to have a conversation with us is if TAC meets and make, makes some kind of decision. They're not coming in separately or individually. They're coming in as a body so that you would have the town, the residents, and TAC. Pat. Uh, we've taken longer with this than I, it would take to have a public hearing. Thank you. So. Uh, Say that again. She said you hadn't been to one yet, but that's, <laughs> yeah, go ahead. All right, Pat, continue. Uh, I'm, I, <laughs> I think I'm gonna side with George. Um, and say, uh, well, no, in the different. I think that we have a plan from the town, and a public here. No, well, wait. That we Pat. they have one that they can give us that can become tangible. So we should set a public hearing date to look at the town's plan. I mean, it's it's sort of what the original resolution. Yeah. Okay, there's a motion on the floor. The motion on the floor is that at the next meeting, we will have material from uh, the TAC, we will have material from the town, and we will have the residence proposal. 
and at that point we will decide if we're going to proceed with the hearing. That's the motion on the floor. Is there any further comment? I don't like the motion. I don't. Fine. I, fine. Okay. Is there any okay. other comment? So I'd like to withdraw it. Hold on. Hold on. We're going to do a yes or no. We're going. <laughs> I'm so <laughs> oh my God. Okay, Steve. So it's not our job to decide which of the three. Right. I, w I wish I knew what we're talking about. Maybe we're talking about doing nothing. Maybe the town plan is no, do nothing. No, we're not. But okay. So, um, but it's not our job to say which one's our favorite, A, B, or C. Really, that's the hope. That's why we have staff, basically, is to reconcile these, um, uh, you know, what may be the same plan or what may be different plans. The way that I see a public hearing is, going back to what Alyssa was saying, is there's one plan. And if people think they have a better plan, that's the time to present that w these are our comments on this better plan. But we should not be treating these as equals. Um, and I, again, I'm going to say I'm very wary to go straight into a public hearing on something that has taken us I don't know how much time tonight because we all feel that this is an important issue. I'm sure Mr. Slaughter could tell us. Um, okay. The question before the council at this point is, we bring forward at our meeting next time, which is February 10th, a report from TAC, a resident petition, and a report from the town and at that point, we decide whether we will proceed with the hearing. Is there any further comment? Alyssa. Because the town report says this is what you should be doing the hearing on. Here's our proposal. This is what the hearing should be, given what TAC said, given what the residents said, given that TAC didn't have time to do it, whatever. The report from the town will not just be generic. It would be a it proposal be, from the town for the which proposal. we would hold a hearing. Okay. Is there any further discussion? We're going to vote on that motion. Just repeat the motion. The motion is. Can you repeat the motion? That the town present its proposal and residents present their plan and a report from the Transportation Advisory Committee at the next council meeting for council discussion and to schedule a public hearing. I, 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 the word I think present is for creating a problem. Okay, so the, the motion and the only thing that was added to that is NTAC. That was a friendly emotion and it was accepted. Provide materials is what Evan Provide material, but you use, okay. The motion is to present. And the, the question is whether present is interpreted in this case as talk to us or provide us in writing or both. And I would at a minimum require it in writing and at that point decide whether or not we're going to have it as a discussion. Okay, present can be any number of things. Okay, any, so it's to present. In other words, have in your packet a town proposal, a citizen's proposal, and materials from TAC. A town proposal, the citizen's petition, the citizen's request. get across. It is not competing oh, it's, proposals. It's the town's has, proposal based on Does the on town that. proposal incorporate the citizen's proposal? I'm asking Paul that. We can do that okay. if you'd like. All right. And then would it incorporate tax so, information if we can get it in time? Okay. So the town's proposal would be there. It would have with it or refer and attach with it the citizen's proposal and the referral from tax, or the opinion from TAC. 
and then I'll work with the president to decide if you want staff here for that meeting or if you just want, if this is a, enough information for the council to make its decision right. on whether to hold a public hearing. Right. Understood. Okay, that's the motion. Any further discussion? All those in favor of that motion, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 One. Aye. Keep your hands up. Opposed. Did you get that? I'm sorry. Opposed. Abstain. So the motion passes. The nose. Eight to five and zero. Okay. Mr. Slaughter, I am so sorry. Good evening. Hi. So, uh, I'll back be in, calling if, you for consultation in the future. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, back in December, uh, I produced an annual report from the Board of License Commissioners, which I believe was in your packet, I hope. It is. Uh, and so, uh, it hit the highlights of what the Board of License Commissioners uh, were able to uh, do over the course of the year. We actually started in, in about February. Um, and you know there are a number of, of uh, more routine things like our short-term liquor licenses. We do a number of those, uh, but we were able to take up a few policy issues and 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 get some uh, particular things on the books, as it were, and and uh, hopefully help frame and shape uh, our alcohol policy in particular uh, in a way that the select board wasn't able to get to. Uh, to be to be perfectly honest, um, we did have to do some enforcement, uh, which was unfortunate. Um, but nonetheless ne necessary. Um, and that got our, uh, as myself was the only one who had served in this kind of role before, I was the only one that had any sort of experience with this and nothing quite like what we experienced. So uh, it was a bit of a trial by fire for my colleagues on the, on the board. Uh, but nonetheless, I think we had a fairly productive year and uh, are continuing to, to work on some, some new areas uh, which are listed toward the, uh, the end of that memo to you all uh, regarding uh, some refinement of things around private clubs and, and some uh, short-term housing re rentals and then of course taking up the idea around local licensing of marijuana sales. Um, so I think I'll start, stop there and answer any questions you all have relative to our work in the last year and, and uh, see if I can be clear on what those things are. Okay. Are there any questions with regard to um, the report from the committee. Okay, then we'll move on to the next items. Oh, I'm sorry. No, okay. Yeah, don't leave yet. Okay. Okay. So. Then in addition to the report, there is a set of issues that the licensing commission has been using as regulations and you have brought to the council for approval. Is that correct? Mandy Jo. I'll ask that question. That's like, it wasn't directly related to the report, but I, um, I am planning on proposing stuff to the council. So the Board of License Commissioners took it upon themselves to enact some regulations that included potential non-criminal disposition penalties. But it's my understanding that you cannot actually enforce those non-criminal disposition penalties unless this body here, the town council, adopts or approves them under our general bylaws. Um, and so I'd like you to talk a little bit about um, a potential process for that. I, the, the packet today includes uh, two potential motions um, and, and my reasoning for it because I intend to bring those motions later. But if you could talk about you know, why you en enact regulations, why you might want to enforce them non-criminally and how you see the potential process of working with us to get those adopted so you can enforce them with non-criminal penalties, that would be great. 
Right. So uh, the idea of the the non-criminal uh, action by us is is as a tool within our enforcement toolkit, um, and to serve in some ways by having that, uh, it's a it serves as a deterrent. Uh, you know, we don't really have a strong expectation of needing those tools. Um, but nonetheless, uh, that's why they were put in place. Uh, many communities have those, and actually, we, when we were working on, on the various regulations this last year, uh, we were leaning heavily on what other communities have done and how they structured their uh, enforcement policies to, to sort of shape ours as well. Um, and again, I think the, the key thing is that the, the hope is to not ever need them, uh, but obviously, if we do, then we have uh, an ability to, to do that. Um, I think there's anything else I wanted to comment on relative to that. I don't think so. Um, again, I think there's a discretionary uh, aspect to it. So even though it says you know this amount for the first offense, this amount for the second, those are all still within the discretion of the board of license commissioners. But, you know, so it's up to but not exceeding is sort of the the uh, the intent of the language. Okay. Would you speak? Would like to speak more specifically to the two regulations? I mean, they, they're included in my motions because they are the two regulations that the Board of License Commissioners has adopted as of the date I wrote that memo. Um, I haven't come back to see if you've adopted any more. Um, so, you know, I, I, there is no proposal from me to modify those regulations. In fact, I would guess that the Board of License Commissioners would probably be unhappy if we attempted to dig, delve into the actual language of the res regulations, I was taking the language of the bylaws we just adopted tonight that requires town council approval of the regulations and trying to just craft a motion that says we approve these so that the board can use all of those tools in the toolbox. Are there questions? If I may add one thing. Um, we do have, um, Similarly crafted private club regulations. We're waiting on some feedback from some of the private clubs relative to those, but they're the sort of enforcement pieces parallels the ones in the other two that we have passed. Dorothy, I think this is a question about licensing marijuana establishments uh, on University Drive. Um, I wrote down a little, I made a little list. Rafters, and then is it 85? Or then there's two in a row: one a former restaurant, and then one that we had a hearing of. And then you just go across the street, go a little jog, and you've got heirloom. And I'm just wondering, do we need all of this? And what happens when people say, "Well, gee, I can't make a living here"? Um, it just seems kind of like a wasteful thing going on. That may very well be the case. Um, you know, it was. Uh And has been, I think, a difficult process for the state to sort of take on the the legalization of marijuana. And so I think a lot of communities, including us, have struggled with how to go through that process in a good way. Um, I think in some ways, though, the, you know, the um, select board previously and the Board of License Commissioners, you know, trying to operate under the best information it's got. And, and at the time uh, that the select board listened to four different proposals, three of which were on University Drive, very close to one another, but still within the zoning uh, regulations of, 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 the, uh, of the town. Um, you know, we, we understood that was an awkward circumstance, but at the same time, um, that is something I would say uh, argues for the need to have a license, because I think you can, you know, sort of quality of life type questions or uh, neighborhood um, uh, aesthetic or neighborhood uh, look and feel that are less quantitative in nature that are you know, I think of sort of zoning uh, regulations tend to be more uh, quantitative and and you know it's this far from the you know one business to the you know a residence and it has more uh, specific requirements in that regard and I think that a a, a, a local licensing option uh, would allow for uh, more uh, qualitative uh, evaluation of, of proposals uh, before they get, and, and a public process before it goes to uh, 
the town manager for, for a local host agreement. Um, once the local host agreement gets in place, uh, you know, then it's a matter of satisfying things for the state. And then once that's done, we're kind of without any options as far as leverage at that point, um, you know, to a large degree. And so this, that's the idea behind exploring that option and, and seeing what our, what our ability is. And, uh, and of course, for establishments that exist before we get it in place, then we have to figure out how to grandfather them in in a way that makes sense for everybody. Are there other comments or questions? Yes, Melissa. Doug is going to talk to me and to Jeff Kravitz before he moves forward with much of the licensing part on marijuana because it's not anywhere near as simple as what you've just described, Dorothy. We don't decide we have too many Chinese restaurants in town. We have zoning that allows for restaurants, and when they need special permits to do it, they get them. Every marijuana business that we have needs a special permit, and we, they also need a host community agreement. And if we refuse to give them a host community agreement because we just think we, there are too many, they will probably sue us. So that is a consideration to be made. But there is some room that we left in the state law because we kept lobbying for it for a local licensing that could perhaps produce better community outreach before it gets to the point a host community agreement. We talked some about that at MMA this weekend. So that's like a whole nother future topic. Right. I did actually have a question about what it is we're doing tonight on the BLC stuff because I'm hearing about the report, I'm sorry, I just flipped pages, that you had written before, Mandy Joe, about the regulations and about the ability to enforce. That's not on our agenda tonight. That's not posted. Right. I assume that's going to GOL. On the other hand, we don't have anything in here about open container. There's nothing in our packet about open container that I could find. So um, I'm confused. Well, it's there. So what's there and what is that? It's a, there is a proposed amendment to the Amherst Open Container Bylaw in your packet. Okay. So in your packet were three items, the food regs, the uh, bring your own booze, okay? And what Mandy Jo, would you please it's explain your intention with us? This is a first reading on this, this point, is and first. that's why we don't have a motion. That's but right. the reason we don't have a motion on the regs thing is just because we just didn't think of it, but we think we can do that. Lynn, Lynn had requested that it be put on a different agenda than tonight's agenda, that it just be sort of talked about in general terms tonight. Do we so need to refer it? Is that what we're trying to do. Is this a first reading? No, it's not technically a first reading um, because it's not on the agenda, right? Oh, um, you, right. When I asked for it to right. be on the agenda, you had decided it wouldn't we show would up as a first reading time. until February 10th at the earliest. Yeah. So wait, so the open container, this is the first reading. This is the first reading. reading. But for the regulations, those that actually is a bylaw change. No. Right, so why do we have to have a first reading again? First discussion under the rules. Of okay. our rules of procedure. Just a first discussion. Discussion, sorry, sorry yes. First. And that first discussion will be on February 10th? Not tonight when okay. he's here. Okay. So if we want, we can either, is there any further discussion about the two items that will come up on February 10th, given that that will be a first reading? Okay. Then those are the regs. Okay. Then the second item, or the third item, is in fact a first reading of, and this is 7A, and this is a first reading of the amendment to the Amherst Open Container Bylaw. So are there questions regarding this? This is something I believe, Doug, that has also been discussed with you. Yeah, we have. <laughs> okay. We haven't taken a formal position. I mean, we're waiting for, uh, you know, essential action by you all. Uh, once that happens, then <clears throat> the Board of License Commissioners would, would, you know, be available to create, you know, to, to offer a short-term license in those mm -hmm. areas uh, that aren't covered now. Um, and we would probably then go through a process of trying to draft regulations to create a process that's formal and 
predictable and acceptable you know, to the community as a whole, but uh, we'd be able to issue licenses essentially immediately once the bylaw passed, and we, you know, we just wouldn't have a framework we'd like to have, but we can still operate within that. Okay. Alyssa. I'm sorry, I've confused matters, but so is someone gonna read this as a first reading, or are we just gonna point at it, or like what's the story? Evan? Are we doing that yes, now? Yes, we're moving we're on to that. that. Right. A different agenda while he's item. here, seven right. A. Yeah, while he's this, here, this whole, and he's going to have to be responsible for this. Let's do this seven whole A. six and seven thing is very uh, confusing. So I'm going to introduce this then, officially to Thank the council, you. Um, and talk about why we're doing this. And I wrote it down because I'm so tired that I'm not sure I'd remember if I didn't. Um, so to preface this discussion a little bit, so I think we know that every June on the Hadleytown Common is the WGBY Asparagus Festival, um, which is a family-friendly festival that attracts people from all over the valley with music and activities and food vendors. Um, and of course, appreciated by many of the attendees, the Beers and Spears area, uh, which allows attendees to enjoy local craft beers from local brewers. Um, in the past summer, we saw on the Hadleytown Common, Common a new community event uh, the Hadley Common Beer and Wine Garden. Um, and I just want, I was looking, reading an article earlier today thinking about this from the Gazette um, that I want to just read a, a brief excerpt from to you. Uh, An effort to nurture new community activities now includes the creation of the Hadley Common Beer and Wine Garden, a family-friendly event which starts at 3.30 p.m. Friday. I love this area and thought, why don't we use it more, says Nicole Bloom of Car Cider House, who is organizing the Hadley Common Fridays with Andrea Stanley of Valley Malt. While beer will be prominently featured, Bloom said the event will promote both food and drink that are made from crops that grow in Hadley soil. The idea is to celebrate Hadley ag agriculture. So both of these events activate the Hadley Town Common, they bring in residents and visitors alike, and they help build community, and neither of these events could ever happen in Amherst. And the reason for that is because our open containers bylaw prohibits the possession of alcoholic beverages on public property without exception. And so tonight I'm introducing to the council a very modest proposal uh, to amend our current open containers bylaw to allow for the regulated and permitted sale and consumption of alcoholic beverages on our town commons and parks. Um, and so I first want to say what this won't do, and then I want to say what I think this will do. Uh, so what this won't do is it will not allow the unregulated consumption of alcohol on our common. I don't want anyone thinking that we are modifying our open containers bylaw and quickly becoming New Orleans. Um, this will in no way remove the general prohibition on public consumption. Um, but what it will do, as Doug just mentioned, is provide the Board of License Commissioners with the flexibility to issue permits for events to allow the sale of alcoholic beverages subject to their rules and regulations. Um, I think that, in my personal opinion, we've seen that in their first year of operation, the Board of License Commissioners has acted deliberately and thoughtfully and rationally uh, in drafting new sensible regulations, applying those regulations, and being incredibly responsive when problems arise. Uh, so this bylaw would give them the discretion to draft regulations around the sale or provision of alcoholic beverages and the discretion as to when to issue permits. So it takes, it creates an opportunity for the Board of License Commissioners that they can use at their discretion um, however they see fit for regulations and permits. Um, and I have faith in their ability to do so responsibly. This also brings our bylaw in line with that of our neighboring communities. Uh, the change is very closely mirrored on Hadley's bylaw. If you read Hadley's bylaw and read what I'm proposing, they are almost the same. It also makes it more similar to Northampton, which allows uh, special permits to be given um, for alcoholic beverages for certain parks, um, for certain events. And the last thing I think that it'll do, which builds upon a conversation we had uh, earlier tonight, uh, I don't know, seven or eight hours ago, I think, um, is that it will better, it'll help to better activate our public spaces. Just like the Asparagus Festival or the Hadley Common Beer and Wine Garden, it will bring in more visitors and residents to our public spaces, or festivals, concerts, celebrations. And this brings more people into our downtown and enhances our downtown vibrancy. And that's the core reason below, uh, behind this bylaw. And so um, I'm happy to field any questions, as I'm sure Doug is, since the Board of License Commission will play uh, a pivotal role in this. Questions? Dorothy. Um, I, want, I want 
to, oops, I want to speak in favor of this because one of the growing industries in the area are local brews. In fact, the, there was some magazine, probably New York magazine, that said a town is not really a town until it has its local beer. And uh, my daughter runs uh, the Chili Fest in Sunderland, and there, uh, every year lately, there are more and more stalls for the local beers, and it's a total family event, and it's very, decorum is observed, even though everybody's having a good time. So I am in favor of this uh, proposal. Okay. Uh, we won't be voting tonight, but is there any other comment at this time? Alyssa. Yes. Next time we get an amendment, if we could please have someone's name on it and a date, I'd really like that. I'm Thank you. I'm pretty sure that would be helpful. Um, I have no idea where it came from. I didn't know if it came from the Board of License Commissioners or the Town Council. My other comment is I am not going to be voting in favor of this, and it's not because I haven't been to almost every Hadley Asparagus Festival. Um, it's because I'm just throwing all the discretion to a Board of License Commissioners that has one person that's ever dealt with licenses before and that has no, at this time, no proposal for how they're going to pick and choose between the taste of Amherst, the Amherst lacrosse team's tag sale, and the Hartford Road Race coming in from out of town and whether or not they get a license. So for some of you, that might be just fine and you'd like all of that, but I would like some indication of where they're planning to slice and dice before I pass the bylaw. I think it could be a really good thing for Amherst. I'm just not comfortable with throwing entire discretion to them when they are not appointed by us, elected, or experienced in this area. And they know I Are there other comments or questions at this time? Kathy? Um, it's, it's more of a comment. Um, seeing Doug's, the long annual report that I found very interesting and the regulations you promulgated to carry out various activities, if, if this went forward, um, I would think that the Board of Licensed Commissioners would have to put out a set of regulations on, on under what conditions. So would, would the bylaw have to be rewritten to add that under regulations that they first promulgate? You know, so that I'm just, you know, so I see with BYOB, you set out, you know, how do you do it and whatever, you know, so under what conditions, so that, I don't quite understand on otherwise how per, you would decide among permits. So I think it would require those kinds of steps. So it's a comment question on uh, how would this work? Okay. All right. Doug. So if I may, um, so if you if you were to make the change uh, to the bylaws that exist now, that would that would you know grant the authority to us to to uh, grant licenses to in those public spaces. How we would do that is, is, again, granted to us. And so what we have done to date, and what I propose we would do as well, is to create a set of regulations which would articulate what kinds of uh, expectations, uh, constraints, um, uh, et cetera, that we would want in place in order to grant that license. Um, you know, I certainly have opinions about what that would be at this moment in time, but you know, we we need to go through our usual process and have all of us think about it and select and see what other communities have done around that. And you know, because a number of communities throughout the Commonwealth that have, that have uh, yes. allowed this type of of uh, you know exception to their open container laws. So you know, we we would do our due diligence in that regard, and I think that. What the regulations allow us to do is have a consistent and, and fair process, but also make clear to anyone who's interested uh, what our expectations are and what our um, uh, frame of reference is as far as, as how we grant these licenses or not. And so you know, we try to do that with our other uh, short-term licenses and, and uh, you know, the BYOB, et cetera, is to try to create that framework that you know, uh, protects everyone involved as well as uh, gives a clear and uh, concise pathway for people to follow the, to apply for a license. I guess the question, the way I'm hearing it is, just as uh, Mandy Jo will be coming back with the BYOB regulations and then also the uh, BLC regulations, no. I'm, I, yeah, the BLC food service regulations. Will this come back to the council as well? 
Uh, yes, I believe so. If, if it's a regulation that we adopt, that we as a Board of License Commissioners adopt, it would, would, would need approval of the, of the Board. Um, only if the regulation has non-criminal penalties included oh, in right. it. No, that's, if it does be, not yeah, include okay. non-criminal no, criminal disposition penalties, right. it would not come back okay. to the right. Council. That's right. Okay. I'm sorry. So does that satisfy your question, Kathy? It, does, it sounded like we wouldn't have to say the Board of License Commissioners would promulgate regulations because that's the way you are proceeding on each right. of these. So that was my question. Do we need to add that? Clause so when we to, do, when we actually not have like just the give, motion, give permits out. Yeah. Okay. Um, Andy. Yeah. Just uh, the, the uh, board of license commissioners and select board before it granted one day liquor licenses all the time. I mean, I can not remember very many select board meetings where the university or Amherst College for an event or a wedding or something wasn't coming before the licensing authority asking for a one-day license. It's a process that worked well under the select board. It is working as well under the Board of License Commissioners. And uh, I think that we just have to uh, recognize that those things are getting granted all the time and that this is analogous and uh, when we come to our second reading, just do it. The only thing that makes it different here is that it's on public property. Yeah. Right. Andy? You want to add? I, I understand exactly what you're saying. I just want to make sure that people understand the difference between a one-day license for a wedding in my backyard and this is that my, my backyard is not public property. This is for public property. I think that the uh, bigger issue is probably um, the control issue of making sure that minors do not... Right. Uh, uh, be placed in a position where they can easily or um, in any other manner um, circumvent the rule on underage drinking, which was actually an issue that has come before licensed commissioners, whether they be select board or the current board previously, because when you give a one-day license and it's for an outdoor location, you have to make sure that the one-day licensee is prepared to deal with that issue. Okay. Any further comment? Yes. So I'm in favor of this because I think it's important for the vibrancy of our town. And my question is that we trust the, the Board of License Commissioners on other aspects. So why are we j doubting their, dis their judgment on this issue? I, I'm not clear that you have universal doubt. I just think that there's some concern that expressed by at least one person. Alyssa? It's not doubt. I mean, a restaurant has a liquor license, a new restaurant has a liquor license, whatever. That's completely different than deciding if a road race on the con that from out of Hartford on the common has beer or deciding if we, we threw extravaganza out, but now we're going to have alcohol even though we literally have problems every single weekend with alcohol and students, which has nothing to do with the Board of License Commissioners most of the time. So, right, we have alcohol problems every week. So what I'm saying is if I had been presented with some information that indicated how they might be slicing and dicing their decision making, I already know what their decision making is because the ABCC controls that they have to work under for restaurants. I don't know what regulations they're thinking of for this. They didn't feel the need to tell me before asking me to pass the bylaw. That would have given me comfort that they had addressed all of these things um, because we've not done it before. That's why, because it's different. Okay. Are there further comments? This is a first reading. Um, unless I hear differently, we would do a second reading at our meeting on February 10th. And we may have something in it that requires that the Board of License Commission come back with us with the regulations as so they relate an, to us if they're non-criminal. There's an right. automatic referral to GOL because it's a bylaw change. There's uh, no guarantee it comes back on February 10th. Because it's whenever GOL finishes its review. 
So it's not coming back on February 10th unless GOL finishes its review. Thank you. That's true. That's what our rules Thank you. say. Our, okay. our rules require so, for bylaw changes that GOL have a report out before right. we vote. I just have a, I'm sorry, I still have a question about what Kathy asked about and what we just said associated with regulations. I thought that what we said was because they would not be writing regulations, I mean, they will eventually write regulations for this because they're smart people. They're not going to just take carte blanche. They assured us of that. I heard that someone wanted to add to the eventual thing that GOL would report out on that they will write regulations rather than just saying, yeah, if you get around to it, you'll write them, and if you don't, you don't. They won't ever come back to us because they don't have anything to do with non-criminal disposition. But it's saying, please write some. Is that what I was hearing earlier tonight? To be clear that we're expecting some to be written down. Whether we agree with them or not is not the issue. Yeah. We don't have to say anything about them because they aren't non-criminal disposition. We're just saying, to be fair, okay. go ahead and write something down. All right. So the path of this at this point is it goes to GOL. GOL may come back and say, yes, please write some regulations. Uh, they won't come back to us unless they have criminal aspects to them. And meantime, it may or may not make it back to us for its second reading by February 10th, but not until after GOL has seen it, right? Any further questions? Okay. All right. Thank you. Doug, thank you. You're welcome. Sorry to have kept you so Glad late. We're moving on to the town manager goals. You've been for provided three different documents in your packet. The first is a set of the goals with all kinds of changes and track changes. And then on the right, in little bubbles, are what each person said to us and what the committee decided. Those exact kinds of things have been repeated in the committee report, which is the two, second of the items. And then you also have a clean copy of the goals. And while I coordinated this committee, I have to say the committee has worked very hard on this, and Kathy Shane particularly has worked hard on this. So. There's a motion. Kathy? Would you like me to read the motion? Please. I move to adopt the document titled Town Manager's Goals FY 2020 as of 1-22-2020 as the FY 21 Town Manager Goals as presented and amended. It says the FY20. Yeah, but that, that's what I'm thinking, that it should be the FY, right? Because FY21 would be next year. It should yes, be it's the FY20. OK, is there a second? OK, discussion, questions? Evan. So last time we had this before us, I expressed some frustration. Um, and so I want to thank the committee for being responsive to that frustration and thank Amherst Media for losing video of that. Um, and so um, I really appreciate the detailed report that we were provided. And I especially appreciate uh, the revised economic development section, which I think uh, better reflects some of the intent that I had um, and so I wanted to just thank the committee for their work. Um, and I, I am prepared to vote for this. My one comment would be under economic development. Um, so that would be 6F, um, uh, work with the bid and others on efforts to enliven downtown. I would have liked to say, see on that and village centers um, to show that we're looking for economic development beyond just downtown in all parts of Amherst. And so um, I would perhaps offer that as an amendment. 
The only problem is the bid is really not focused on anything but downtown. So I, I yeah. yes. It says and others. Okay. So the amendment, there's a friendly amendment of making the sentence for six, no, for, yes, for six F, work with the bid and others on efforts to enliven downtown and village centers, period. Are there other discussion questions, comments? Dorothy. It's adding just a few words on um, number one, B, three. Negotiate contracts, including collective bargaining contracts, that take into account the overall fiscal health of the town, and I would like to add, and the needs of the workers. That's a little more, yes, Paul. So I guess the question I have posed every time was how would you measure that? And how would I be accountable right. for that? How would you, what would I give you as evidence? Well, your, well, I guess your um, wellness program, uh, retention of workers, happiness of workers, I don't know. Maybe we, were, we talked about getting a, more of a feedback from the employees than we got this last time. Or comparison with other towns' um, benefits and salaries. You know, it just seemed a little exploitive to just to be the overall fis the fiscal health of the town, saying, oh, we're having a hard time, I'm going to cut your health insurance. Or, Not that people don't do that, but I would hate to have our town do it. I understand what you're saying. I just don't know how I, what I would provide to you. Are you asking me to do a survey of communities or conducting a survey of some sort. Uh, um, I don't know what evidence I would provide to the right, council right. to meet that goal. And if you would tell me what would be satisfactory to you, I can do that. Well, I guess if you had a union, they would know, but you, you don't have a union. Um, right? Okay, there's a motion, but it's not been seconded. Um, is there a second to this? I'll second. Okay. Let me mention that the word negotiation implies that you've got two sides and the, and the, and therefore all of those issues are on the table. Right. Okay. So are you interested in withdrawing the motion? Yes, I think that does, that does answer it. Okay. And Andy, you're fine? Okay. Are there any further comments or questions? Okay. Then we really have um, actually uh, two motions that we need here. The first is the one that Kathy made and it's been seconded, and that's to adopt the document titled Town Manager Goals FY 2020 as of 1-22-2020 as the FY 20 Town Manager Goals is presented, or as amended actually now. Is there any Further discussion, yes, Alyssa. For the thousandth time, can we include performance goals? This is part of a performance evaluation. The town the manager's performance, performance goals. goals. Okay. Is there any further discussion? Is that a friendly amendment? Yes. Okay. Any other further discussion? No. Shalini? Uh, regarding adding the village centers, I'm obviously very interested in developing the South Amherst village centers, but given the short span of time that we have, uh, I, would, I would like to see us focusing on a single goal of really on the projects that we have for downtown and getting that done. But that being said, uh, maybe I just want to ask Paul how, what he feels about adding, like what 
you know, that's a discussion we've always had. What can you show us to show that you did something? Maybe it's the, I don't know. Is this specifically to the friendly amendment that was made earlier? The one at 6F. Paul? Yeah, so, so we have five months at this point to accomplish these 50 goals or whatever they are. Um, so it's okay to have a goal in there and it's okay for me to say I wasn't able to do anything on it and then you would judge whether I had time and should have done something on it. I think that would be the answer to that. If you thought it was important to include, it's okay to include it. I might not have a positive response to you. Okay. Kathy? I, I just want to add to what Chalini, if I, I think of you're trying to enliven downtown and North Amherst over the next five months. It's, you're, you're going to fail if you try to do all of it. So I, I think maybe think of keeping that in for next year, you know, that expansion, because it's it, asking for two tasks in one piece seems a lot. You know, I don't really care because he can say I didn't do anything with village centers. Okay. But it, it was made like as a friendly gonna, amendment. If that's going to be the response, why would we add okay. it? Yeah. So I'm going to ask Evan, make it as an amendment, please. Or withdraw it. 6F? Yes. Uh, Either withdraw your reason. friendly oh. amendment or make an amendment or make a motion. Okay, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna make the amendment, um, which is to amend six F to add and village centers after downtown. Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion? And I, and I just want to say I appreciated Paul response Paul's response, but I do think this is for us to evaluate the town manager. But this is also a public facing document, and I I do hear from people sometimes who say there's so much focus on the downtown. What about East Amherst? And and that's part of the reason behind this, even if. I don't reasonably expect Paul to make huge progress in East Amherst over the next five months. Okay. Is there any further discussion on this? Then we're going to vote on the amendment. The amendment is to amend 6F to read, work with the bid and others on efforts to enliven downtown and village centers. All those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain. Did we get everybody? Okay, the motion passes. And it was, what was the? 10-1-2, thank you. All right, and the performance goals, unless there's an objection to that, I'm not gonna call for an amendment. All right, we're back to the original motion. The original motion is to adopt the document titled the town, town manager's performance goals FY 2020 as of 1 2020 as the FY 20 town manager goals as amended. Is all those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain. Okay. The next thing um, is this committee has morphed in a couple of different ways, and so I think it's time to clean it up and get rid of it. And the, so I'd like a motion to dissolve the town manager and town council goals ad hoc committee. Second. Second. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor? Raise your hand and say aye. aye. Opposed? Abstain? And while we're at it, there's this other group out there, and it's called the Town Council Goals Ad Hoc Committee, which we never dissolved before either. So I'm going to suggest that we have a motion. Do I hear a motion to dissolve the Town Council ad hoc Goals Ad Hoc Committee? So moved. Is there a second? Discussion? Darcy? Okay. It is floating around, but it hasn't met in a many a month. Okay, any further discussion? All those in favor, say aye and raise your hand. Aye. Aye, opposed? 
abstain. All right, we're moving right along. Um, we're now moving on to the reorganization standing committees. Uh, this is a GOL, and it's all only about the finance committee. George? Yes, um, GOL in its last meeting um, took this up. We felt there was a fairly strong uh, sense from the council that, that at least this area we could act, and so we did vote unanimously to dissolve the audit committee and assign all its duties uh, that are listed under the charge um, in the audit committee charge adopted by the council. So what we're, suggest what we're asking is that you um, put the audit committee out of existence and move its uh, duties to finance. Okay. Is there discussion? Yeah. Let's have the motion. So the motion is to dissolve the audit committee. I'm sorry? Go ahead. <laughs> I move that we dissolve uh, the audit committee and assign all duties listed under section charge in the audit committee charge adopted by the council on March 18th, 2019 to the finance committee. Second. I'd like an amendment effective immediately. I think they're always effective immediately, as long as if we don't put a different effective yeah. date on. And bylaws effective 14 days later, but. Okay. 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 Yeah. Dissolve. All right. Dissolve. So, is there a, there's a motion has been made and seconded. Is there any further discussion? Then all those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 Opposed. Abstain. All right, and then we need one more motion, and that is a motion. No, we don't. This did it. Thank you. Okay. Um, committee liaisons. Evan. Yes. So you caught me a little bit by surprise in this moment right now. So Oka discussed. Let me back up. Uh, in our September retreat, uh, there was a conversation that was had about liaisons. And because liaisons are appointed by the town council, uh, they fell within the realm of OCA, uh, and so it was referred to OCA. OCA sat on that responsibility for some time as we had a couple other things on our plate. Um, but we did meet on December 20th um, to start the process of appointing liaisons. And what we saw is the very first step to do that um, was not to recommend any particular appointments, but merely to come up with a list of committees uh, that we feel it would be appropriate to have liaisons. And so uh, this was in your packet for the January 6th meeting, um, because that's when it was originally on the agenda. It, does not look like it was moved over into tonight's meeting packet. So I, I, I don't know um. if people had an opportunity to reread or remember. And so um, I can go through the document if we feel like that's what we want to do. But I might also suggest that since this isn't pressing and since this is maybe not fresh on people's mind, it might also be something that we hold. We would bring it back up on February 10th and move the document itself into the agenda. Okay, I'm sorry that the document didn't get carried over. Um, so this is now going to February 10th. Okay, we're up to appointments. And that is also Evan. Okay, so um, we have had a vacancy on the planning board since early October um, and a vacancy announcement posted on the website since October 21st. Uh, as everyone on this council is perfectly well aware, uh, OCA spent almost all of its efforts over the fall uh, developing a process to recommend appointments uh, by the town council to multiple member bodies. Um, we adopted that process on December 9th, and then we have spent the month of January 
uh, working to implement it. Uh, I Oka met this morning and I thanked my committee members, but I want to do so again here in front of you all to say that Oka had five meetings over the month of January, some of them fairly lengthy, to make sure that we could have this planning board appointment to you here tonight. Um, given that the planning board has been experiencing a fairly significant burn it, uh, burden with having a vacancy on the planning board. Um, the biggest part of this process were the public interviews, which were conducted last Wednesday. Some of you here were in attendance. Uh, all of, not all of you, many of you who were in attendance uh, have given me some feedback on those. Oka started those discussions uh, today, having sort of a debrief and reflection. Um, so I'm going to ask that our conversation tonight focus solely on our recommended appointment and the candidate and not on the process, um, though we will continue offline to take your feedback on that process and continue those conversations. Uh, we had three candidates up uh, who we interviewed, uh, Jacob Hirsch, Douglas Slaughter, and Bob Greeny. Uh, I don't, that, Douglas that Marshall. Marshall, sorry, <laughs> sorry. Douglas Slaughter did not interview. It's getting late, y'all. So um, after we met shortly after the interviews to have uh, about an hour of deliberation around the candidates, uh, I'm going under the assumption that y'all have read the report, and so I don't need to detail um, all the aspects of the deliberation. What, would, what we did come out of that um, is the majority of the committee uh, felt as though the strongest candidate to emerge from those interviews was Douglas Marshall. And the three overarching things that we felt um, made him the strongest candidate, one was his professional experience. We've heard from the chair of the planning board that they're in need of someone coming in with professional experience. It's a fairly young board. Uh, the longest serving member currently has been on there for four years and what we've heard is that there's a significant learning curve um, and there was really a desire to have someone who comes in with some planning background um, which Doug brings from UMass. Uh, we also uh, felt as though his sustainability credentials were really strong. Doug uh, Marshall chaired the building committee of the Hitchcock Center, which is a living building, a net zero building, and we felt that as we're approaching our climate action goals, as we're looking at a master plan update that will likely incorporate aspects of sustainability, having someone with that commitment to sustainability, but also that experience in sustainability from a planning and architecture perspective was really useful. And the last thing, which at first we went back and forth on and whether this was a, a strength or a concern, um, but landed on strength was Doug's connection to UMass. Um, there, were, there were some questions about whether that was a good thing or a bad thing, but what we came down on is that we have our master plan and UMass has their master plan, um, and often those two are siloed. And we, we see that having someone who works for UMass campus planning allows for potential uh, better communication, coordination, and collaboration when it comes to planning between the university and the town. And so those three things are really what we felt put Doug um, at, at the top of our list. And so uh, we bring him uh, to, we don't, we're not physically bringing him, we bring to you tonight uh, a recommendation, um, which would be to appoint Douglas, Ma Douglas Marshall to the planning board effective immediately for a term expiring June 30th, 2021, I believe is the motion. As recommended by the... As recommended by the Outreach Communications and Appointments Committee. Okay. Since that's a motion, is there a second? Okay. Um, we move to council discussion at this time. Is there comment? Dorothy? I did attend the um, interviews, and it did go smoother than I thought it might. Um, and I, you know, I, I think it was good that it was public um, for the, partly also for the other candidates so they could see what the other people said um, and feel, you know, the, the rightness or wrongness of the decision. Um, the one small thing, that one of the candidates did not mention on his CAF or in his speech what he did for a living. And I, I guess part of me still wants the ability of the committee to ask some follow-up questions, um, because that would I would have okay. asked him that. Okay. And so are, we're, we're actually speaking to the motion for this candidate. 
if you have additional comments and you have, they've gone to Evan in regard to the committee as they consider the efforts. So I, I agree with their decision. Okay. Are there other comments at this time? Oh, I'm sorry, Mandy Jo. It's kind of a hybrid. I, I support the recommendation and I feel very comfortable supporting it this time, partly because we had much more information and I felt a lot more comfortable with the process that brought that recommendation to us. And I, you know, I, that's not necessarily a comment on how that worked, but, but the comfort level compared to our last planning board appointments and how that process ended up bringing stuff to us, this, this seems like a much better okay. way to get to a recommendation so I can support it wholeheartedly. Okay, are there other comments with regard to the candidate or the motion on the candidate? Darcy? I, I just wanted to say that um, I was the lone member of the committee that didn't vote for the candidate and I abstained. And the reason that I abstained was, um, which I hadn't really gelled in, in the evening when we were deliberating, but um, it's pretty much because I felt like I didn't have adequate information. And part of the reason why I felt like I didn't have it was because um, I had earlier wanted to add a question in the selection criteria that would include um, whether a candidate brings a perspective that otherwise isn't represented on the planning board. And so that wasn't one of the questions or one of the selection criteria, but it was something that I wanted to know. Um, and I also wanted to be able to ask um, follow-up questions, as Dorothy said. You know, I felt like after hearing what they had to say in response to our very specific questions um, that I, I didn't have enough information. Okay. Is there any other comment at this time, Alyssa? I would love us to have a conversation at some point, perhaps at a retreat, about how to talk about things at a committee and then how to do your report at the full town council. We specifically asked for the reason for abstaining because we thought we all needed to take a position one way or the other. We always include in detail what the various positions are. As you saw, we had mixed votes on certain parts of the process. Mm -hmm. The fact that the process was decided for someone to say now, but I didn't get what I wanted for the process, it is just really frustrating to me when we had this conversation at OCA. So I think it might be good if the council reviews what we feel our culture is for when you have a discussion and you attempt to cover it in writing and the person does not choose to do it that way and then gets to talk at length at a town council meeting about how their position is different that's just very uncomfortable to me if we haven't had a, more of a group discussion on what our group norms are associated with that. Are there other comments? Dorsey? I would just like to respond that um, what I just said was not my definition of speaking at length. And I, I think that I don't really take up that much of the council time in comparison to some other counselors. So, I, I think that if I'm a minority opinion and uh, I want to say something about why I voted the way I did, I think I have every right to do that. Okay. Are there other comments at this time? There is a motion on the floor. The motion's been made and seconded. The, I will get to it in a moment. The motion is to appoint Douglas Marshall to the Planning Board effective immediately for a term expiring June 30th, 2021, as recommended by the Outreach Communication Appointments Committee. All those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain. Okay. All right. We're moving on to committee reports. And the audit committee has been dissolved, so Pat. <laughs> 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 yeah, 
All right. I will say as the final report for the audit committee that I have to cancel this week's meeting. Thank you. <laughs> and the agenda item that was going to be on the audit committee meeting is actually now on the finance committee meeting. All right. The bylaw review committee has also been dissolved. So there's no report there. Um, commun CRC, Mandy Jo. I think my report pretty much consists of read the report. No, <laughs> we, we CRC reported out this week as per our referral on the downtown parking working group priority recommendations. The CRC's report essentially recommended that the council um, incorporate those priority recommendations, the three of them into the town council performance goal, the town manager performance goals, they have pretty much been incorporated into that. So they worked the goals ad hoc committee that's now been dissolved, had that report in enough time to be able to work them into the goals that we just adopted. Okay, and we appreciated that. Uh, the town manager and council goals has been dissolved. Finance committee. Uh, Given the hour, I'm going to be real brief. We will have a more substantial report at the next council meeting. We have a um, committee meeting tomorrow, which had, we hope to bring conclusion to the discussions on our recommendation on the housing policy and the ad hoc um, percent for our bylaw recommendation. And we will, we have, as um, Lynn noted, the um, first um, substantive discussion about audit responsibilities uh, going forward and appreciate the work of the prior audit committee and thank them um, and we'll do our best to take, take their place and uh, do at least as well as they did. We, that is a hard goal, but we will try. Uh, the um, other things that are on there um, include several things. One is to review where the budget is now, in um, that we have the governor's budget out and see if we can get some comparisons. Um, a big issue will be there are a number of, as I reported at the last meeting, financial orders that uh, we will need to bring to you that are just um, things that are needed to keep us moving forward, making transfers and other things that have to happen. And <clears throat> I think that the other thing, the reason I want to, and I'll end with it, is we're going to have a brief discussion about um, Saturday's Four Towns meeting. And just want to remind all of you that there is a Four Towns meeting and uh, we have no sense of how contentious or non-contentious it might be about the regional school budget to be proposed and the assessment methodology. And so that's, uh, just want to remind you about Saturday's meeting. We have posted that meeting so that if there is a quorum, we will call a meeting to order. Alyssa. Will we just continue to assume that Mr. Steinberg will largely take the lead for us on that? Like we, we voted been? that in um, oh, back in uh, November or something like that. Yes. Right. Thank you for however many of those meetings. Yes. For planning purposes, how long is that meeting scheduled for? An hour and a half, two hours, two? two? Okay. Uh, yeah, it's about two. Okay, um, and it is at the middle, middle school library. Okay, GOL, anything else, George? Uh, well, if you've had a chance to look at the report, um, there are two things we've been working on. Um, one item was just accomplished a few moments ago, which was dissolving audit and moving its duties to finance. We're going to continue to look at um, what, uh, and, and make a recommendation to you at some point soon about breaking up CRC and uh, potentially moving OCA's appointments, uh, some, excuse me, moving appointments to some other body. I've heard from four counselors to date on this, and I appreciate that. Um, there are still four that I haven't heard from, and if you have any thoughts, um, they would be valuable. But uh, we want to uh, bring some kind of recommendation to you on this as soon as we can. We meet on Wednesday. 
The second item is there is do the issue of a process for public ways requests which require town council action. Um, this is probably new to all of you, um, but uh, I really do would appreciate comments from you as to what is you're looking for. I thought I had an idea of what uh, you were looking for and it seems I don't. So um, we're working on this. Uh, there's a brief description of our initial discussion and so any input you can send to me directly and only to me would be appreciated. Okay. Present for it. Kathy? I'm sorry? Um, I Oka, I'm sorry. I skipped over one. Oka. Three quick things. One is, as I mentioned, we have been, we started this morning sort of debriefing the process. So if anyone has feedback who, uh, based on that, you feel free to send to me. Uh, two, we did vote this morning to recommend approval of the three sets of town manager appointments that were received, cultural council, council on aging, participatory budgeting. So you can expect to see those, I believe, on the February 10th town council agenda. Um, and the third thing is that OCA is uh, positioning itself to move forward on ZBA. We have one vacancy on ZBA. We will have a second vacancy on the ZBA in March. Um, and so OCA is beginning to put together the beginning stages of filling those vacancies. Could you just remind me, on planning board and ZBA, do we have any terms expiring at the end of June? Uh, off the top of my head, I, I, do we do for both. I don't know how many for ZBA. We do have three for planning board. So you're going to be starting that process momentarily. Yeah. OK. Um, anything else? Yes. The openings on ZBA, is that because of retirements that are forced by time limits or people um, quitting? Uh, both are resignations. There's, there's two openings right now on ZBA. Both are resignations. Okay. Um, percent for our bylaw, Kathy? Uh, I think we're almost done. I, tomorrow, finance will look at a somewhat revised bylaw that was revised when CRC raised some questions. And we thought they were good questions. And as a committee, we believe we addressed them. So a revised, revised version has gone back to CRC, which I think is meeting on it this week. And the finance report that you will get on this as a, a request from one of the members, uh, the resident members, was a, a few numbers on what the recommended bylaw would do over time uh, to, in terms of financial impacts. So it will enable people to say, what did we do if we go ahead and adopt this bylaw in finance-wise? OK. All right. Um, moving on, minutes. We have two sets of minutes, both for, for January 6th. One was for the special council meeting, which was swearing in. Uh, the second was for our regular meeting. Um, the motion is to approve the minutes of the January 6th special council meeting swearing in ceremony and January 6th, 2020 town council meeting as presented. Is there a motion? A second? A second. Thank you. Any further discussion, questions, corrections? And Mandy Jo. So I didn't really want to move it because I got a question that I might want, I, I kind of want some thoughts on. At the last, at the January 6th meeting during um, item number 5B, which was the studio apartment supportive housing, during the public comment period, there was a member of the public that chose not to give that member's name. Right. Um, a number of us know that member's name, and our council rules generally require that a member of the public give their name. This was really one of the first times we were presented with someone time. saying, I'm not going to, and you know, I, I understand how the president may not, have under, not, not, may not have known what to do when that happens in the moment because you hadn't really thought about that right. happening. Um, so my question is right now, the minutes do not identify that person by name. Um, is it appropriate to go back to the minutes and identify that person? Is it not? Um, and if not, I would like 
someone <clears throat> or at least the president uh, or council ideas to whether the president should come up with a process for when that happens, how to deal with it in the moment. So if it happens the next time, mm -hmm. she hasn't, she's got a plan. Um, or whether the council itself should have a plan or revisit its rules to deal with such a so situation. Let's deal with this to the issues. Right now we just have a motion on the table to accept the minutes for these two events. Do you want to try to amend those, that motion? I, I don't know. I, I have less experience with this particular issue than others on this council, so I would love to hear some others' thoughts on whether it would be appropriate to make a motion to put that person's name in the minutes or not. Alyssa. So I'm not aware of any case law on this. It has not come up from that standpoint as in per X, Y, Z, you have to do this. It has, however, come up that we do need to protect people's privacy if they ask for it. We cannot put their name in just because we know it. If they chose not to identify themselves, then we need to leave it at that. Now, they were on camera, so I'm not sure how it's really protecting them much privacy-wise, mm -hmm. but it was their choice, and I don't think we can demand it of them. I also don't think we can be put in a position where we say, if you refuse to tell us who you are, you're not allowed to speak in public. I'm fairly certain that would result in a lawsuit. Right. So I, people have different reasons for different levels of privacy consideration. I would just say a person who chose, who, who asked not to be identified, a person mm -hmm. who asked not to be identified or however else you do it, but I think it would be a terrible mistake to go in and add the name in or to try and demand that the person tell us who they are. Um, given the lack of a policy, I feel like we should pass the minutes the way they've been presented and then come back to the issue if we um, feel we need one. Um, let's just stick to the minutes as presented. Are there any other questions or comments on this? All right, then we're going to move to approve the minutes, and that's both sets of minutes. All those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain. Okay. You've got the abstentions? Okay, so it's 10-0-3. Um, on your other bigger question, it is in our rules of procedure that people must identify themselves. And I'm, I'm inclined that if somebody does not want to state their name they have good reason without, I mean, the option would be that I would have to call a recess, go talk with them, find out why they weren't going to give me, give their name. At that point, we've, it's all been on TV and whatever exposure they were trying to avoid, we have just forced it. So I'm kind of of the opinion that if somebody feels so strongly that they cannot state their name, we need to just respect that. But yeah. And we have it in our values that we want to make it comfortable for people to speak up. And, and so I think that value of participation um, right. also. Right. Shalini. I mean, Kathy. That's okay. We're, we're similar. Um, <laughs> That's okay. Um, I, I, she usually sits there. I, I agree with that. And I want to point out that we did have another incident of it um, last June when we were doing uh, the public forum around 132 Northampton Road, someone said, you know, they they didn't want to, re it was put them at risk to even come forward at all. And yeah. so I think we need to respect that someone's willing to come and talk to us, um, as you said, and put right. themselves out there. Right. Whatever the cir different circumstances will lead to right. different reasons. The, the other piece that goes with that is what, what somebody views as being at risk may not be something I view as being at risk. And that puts me as the, you know, as the presider over the meeting or whoever's presiding in a position of making judgment. And I, I mean, unless we define what the reasons can be, I would find that most uncomfortable. Mandy Jo. It, everything people have said in theory, I agree with. Um, 
The attorney in me says this is a very slippery slope to ending up that not a single person that talks to us in public identifies themselves. And I'm not sure I'm comfortable with that. If you're going to come to a meeting, the standard should be you state your name so we know who is talking to us. Um, and, you know, it's, it, if, and I, I don't know how to solve that problem, but yeah. I have large concerns that if a person can just say, well, I don't want to identify myself, we'll never have anyone identify themselves because that will become the norm, and that creates its own transparency problem. Right. Yeah, I agree the, with that. The only thing Kathy. is a lot of people want to be on public record. They're coming here to, you know, the right. same way they're writing to right. us, with you, that they have a point of view and they want us to acknowledge it. Yeah. Um, okay, I don't want to spend a lot of time at this meeting on this issue. I guess what I would like to suggest is that at some point, should GOL have room on their agenda? Yeah. <laughs> they can discuss this, but otherwise, um, I would ask that you just respect my judgment. Okay? Thank you. Um, moving on. <laughs> Town manager's report. Oh, you say that every every town council meeting. And he gets shortchanged every so, time. So uh, the first thing is just remind you that on Saturday you have the four towns meeting, uh, and then at 1 o'clock is the reading of the proclamation uh, for Black History Month in front of town hall. Um, also for Black History Month, February 8th from 11 to 3, there is a celebration in the Banks Community Center. Um, on January 29th, Wednesday, I believe, there'll be a uh, effort to count the homeless for the complete count committee. So the, um, uh, the three county con continuum of care will be organizing the count in Hampshire, Franklin, and Berkshire counties, and they'll be reaching out with uh, the research outreach teams from Elliott Home Services and ServiceNet to go and find everybody who's homeless on that night and then that, that will be counted towards the census. Um, did that one already? Oh, at the Four Towns meeting, uh, at the uh, MMA annual meeting, I believe we have not received numbers yet, but I think our health insurance, the change to Maya will have been paid off. The health insurance increases will be pretty competitive, so that will solve a lot of the problems that might have been brought up at the four towns meeting because it'll reduce the impact of the budget on the other towns as well. So I haven't seen the numbers on that, but Mike and I are looking at that. Uh, Winterfest is coming up, starts February 1st, Saturday uh, with Luminaria and the bid and the chamber have been very uh, helpful in doing that. And if you haven't been, go to the common um, on, uh, on Saturday night. It's really kind of cool the way they set it up. It's, it's a neat, really neat thing. They have ice sculptures and all kinds of stuff, and they have lanterns throughout the common. Um, Valley CDC has submitted its request for a project eligibility letter for 132 Northampton Road to the state. We have not heard from the state yet as to when we have not received their project, the letter from the state, and that's what triggers the 30-day comment period. And we will treat this just the way we did for the um, uh, North, uh, North Square at the Mill District Beacon Project. Uh, we will have a, a project page on the Planning Department website where all the comments will be gathered there. Um, there will be a press conference uh, a week from Friday, February 7th at 9 a.m. in the town in here to further promote the efforts to encourage members of the community to participate in the census. If any councilors would like to be here and be part of that, you're welcome to that. Uh, the, um, if many of you were there at the Maya um, luncheon where our staff received a um, Most Innovation in Wellness Award uh, at the 400 person uh, luncheon and was very proud of our staff for making that happen. That, uh, our wellness ambassadors are Joanne Mizziasiak, uh, Brianna Sunred, and Ella Stocker. Did I get that right? No, I never get her name right. Um, <laughs> Uh, the East Street School, we have reviewed the uh, one response that had come to the East Street School. You know that we rejected that bid. We have met with the bidder to understand what the challenge was in the RFP. Uh, we have considered um, some of the work that we would need to do to make the RFP a more attractive RFP. 
we will in, be investigating. One, for instance, one of the things was the bidder didn't know what the situation was with asbestos in the existing East Street School. So we're going to spend a little bit of money to assess what kind of asbestos liabilities are in the East Street School. That will give the bidders more information to decide if they can respond or not. Um, the North Amherst Library, I think I've reported this before, there's an anonymous donor who's interested in moving the project forward. Um, and we, I'm hoping that we will have a, a proposal to you at your next meeting in February. Uh, the way we would set it up is that the funds would be set aside uh, for conducting the plans and then before any work is completed, the funds to actually do the construction would be set aside. So that's the, that's the goal and I'll, we can have more detail about how that, what that would look and whether the, the council would like to accept these gifts or not and do the work. Um, and that's my report other than what's already written. Are there any questions at this time? Yes, Mandy Jo. Um, health insurance rates, it, many of us were at the Maya luncheon where they talked about what the average rate increase will be and all. What was built into the budgets that we initially saw? 6%. Okay. But we don't have our percentage yet. Uh, though we're pretty, con I'm, con I'm confident, we don't have, no, we do not have the percentage yet, but I'm confident they will be much better than that. Okay. Because we've had ex excellent experience. Okay. Other questions of the of the manager? Okay. Um, Lynn, Lynn I don't sorry. have a question. I just have, want to uh, commend you and your staff for what you did for Martin Luther King Day on the steps, but then over at Jones Library, Jordan Moiston, uh, the videos that were put together, the clips of the Jobs and, and Justice March 1963 were amazing, and the discussion was fabulous. And I know a lot of extra work went into that, so I uh, think it goes over and beyond, and I want to thank Great. whoever else was part of that. But Yeah, but Jennifer, definitely. you're right. You identified the correct person. She was the lead on that and did a really terrific job. Thank you for noticing that. Right. Any other comments or questions? Okay, then we're moving on to town, town council comments. I provided you a memo in which I've um, reviewed and, rec and stated what my plan would be for standing committee appointments and, and ad hoc, or the, there are no ad hoc at this time, and then the procedure that I would propose to use for multiple member bodies. Um, and then I also wanted to make sure you had a full account of the committees. Um, this is the ongoing spreadsheet that I've used all year. Um, if you have any feedback on this, please provide it to me, but I don't think we have the energy at this point to discuss it. The biggest dilemma I have right now is that we're, if we are going to change our committees, then how do I do reappointments? And at the same time, the clock is ticking. Um, I mean, I have to be honest and say, particularly for the finance committee, it's either change now or don't, uh, because we're gonna enter into the finance committee year. So um, I might set up a trial balloon and see what people say on that, uh, JCPC as well, um, which are the really two kind of time sensitive, and then come back with that. But just keep in mind as you respond, and I'll put this in the email, that um, you know we have the other committees to consider as well. Um, if that's acceptable, then I'll just keep moving on. Uh, five councillors have expressed interest in attending agenda setting meetings, and I have already done invitations to them for certain dates specific. Um, those meetings are always at two o'clock on Tuesdays, on when, excuse me, two o'clock on Wednesdays in the town manager's office. Um, based on the poll of town councillors and looking at um, and looking at the topics and so forth, we're still working on uh, scheduling some informal information sessions uh, based on the expressed interest. There was no one solid kind of individual interest in topics, but we will look to schedule those probably on Friday mornings be early and ending before 10.30. Um, the, um, we did receive the report from the consultants on the listening sessions, it's on the website, and as I mentioned when I sent it out to you, I'm looking for any volunteers who would like to help with content analysis. I've gotten two volunteers, and I'm willing to do that myself, but 
more is always helpful. Um, in terms of future agenda items, I really haven't made progress on this, and part of it is trying to figure out how to present it in such a way that it is, because it's a dynamic document. It, it, it changes literally by the day. And so it's, it's trying to figure out how to do that. So if you'll just be patient with me, I'll continue to try to come up with a way to forecast future meetings. Um, and then the retreat is now scheduled for March 21st, and I've asked you for other topics for that as well. Any other questions? Yes, Pat. I don't think that you have to forecast which meeting it's coming to. For me, it's knowing what is in the pool of things that we okay. need to look at. All right, thank you. Or begin to look at. Okay. Just a rolling set of issues. Okay. All right. I mean, it, literally, an example, this last meeting, I went in thinking one, we threw off one, we added another, we should have thrown off two others, you know. It's just... <laughs> It's, it's a dynamic process, okay? Um, future agenda items, anything anybody wants to bring up, particularly at this point? Yes, Alyssa. Yes, I want to prevent George's agenda item. I'm gonna be clear on that. So he mentioned in his report that GOL wants to talk about dumping OCA soon. OCA just met this morning and it never came up that that was going to happen soon. And so therefore, we didn't add it to our list of agenda items, which for our meeting is the 10th, which is the same night as the town council meeting. Okay. So let's not talk about dumping OCA at the February 10th town council meeting, because OCA needs time to discuss that before we hear again why it needs to happen to us. Okay. Sarah, yes. I would just like to um, second that because this morning, when we had an OCA meeting, there was a certain contentious uh, subject that came up, and I said that I would rather not waste time on that if OCA was going to be dissolved soon, which, was, which is what I assumed, and then I heard from other people who have more of a deciding factor on it than what happens. You just assume you'll keep going. So I just, I don't, I welcome any, any discussion either way. It's just more helpful to me if I actually know where we're going, that, that's all. Thank you. Any further comments on future agendas? Yes, Shalini. <clears throat> Maybe this is for the retreat, um, but I was struggling with the harassment issue of town employees and committee members um, by residents. And again, I learned a lot at the MMA conference because I attended the civility forum. And uh, one of the things I learned from the town councilors there who was presenting is that the town council has a code of conduct in which we set the example for the residents of how we speak to each other. And so maybe we could come up with a code of conduct of you know kindness and curiosity. And it doesn't mean we don't ask questions, but it's how we ask questions. And so we could come up with something, and I think they even said there's a visual that they provide at town council meetings for the residents to see that this is our code of conduct. So it's kind of, it starts here as a leadership and then it's, and we can find other ways of course brainstorm, but then it spreads into the community how we crea create a culture of kindness and caring and so forth. Okay, additional comments at this time. Kathy. Um, I'll, I, I do wanna, Pat Shalini on the back because we have a value statement at the back of rules and we might want to move it to the front of rules and take another look at that at the retreat. But on a separate topic, um, the exciting package that we got for downtown uh, sits there along with the four buildings we've talked about. And then I just read through the facilities report for the community fields that range for it, the plans um, range from four million to six and a half million of town dollars. And then there are, so I would like maybe at the retreat to put the big, big picture up um, of what we have flowing at us so that we don't do each in its own silo. Um, right. We have some really hard choices to make. Um, especially on timing when we can be seriously talking about something yeah. versus wishfully talking about it. 
Okay. Yes, Dorothy. Uh, I understand the um, interest in a civility code, and I'm not unalterably opposed to it. But I find it possible to survive these long meetings because the individual voices of the counselors are still theirs. I would just hate to have us all sound the same, talk the same, introduce things in the same way. And I enjoy being involved in a group of different people. So that's my thoughts, comment. Yeah. All right, and that, we'll save the rest of that conversation for the retreat. Uh, further comments at this time? Uh, Councilor comments, any further reports or anything? Okay, there are no topics reasonably, un, no topics not reasonably anticipated, and there's no executive session. Do I hear a motion to adjourn? There's a motion to adjourn. Is there a second? I second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? I guess it was unanimous. Well done.